affects us some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. All right, welcome to episode 328 of We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle here on the We Are Libertarians Network. This is episode, uh, again, 328. Sorry, it's November 13th. Uh, we are, my, my guest, well, my co-host for the evening will be Hody Johns. Uh, I'll explain where Harry's at in a moment. And we'll be talking election midterm recap stuff. We're going to talk the House, the Senate, the governors, the libertarians. we got all kinds of things to talk about here in just one moment. Warning, this show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. All right, welcome to We Are Libertarians. Again, I am Chris Spangle, and uh, because I don't think I can contain him for much longer, I want to introduce uh, my co-host for this episode, his first time on the big show, Hody Johns. Hody, how are you? Oh, I am so pumped up. I finally made it here. Hold, hold on. I, be, I, I have one fatal it. flaw with this particular setup is that I need to, to have you on the same volume here. So, Hody, how are you? Oh, I need to be louder. I'm great. No, I'm great, man. I'm just so excited to be on the big show. I can finally tell my mom I finally made it on to the best libertarian podcast on planet Earth. If you're anything like me, I don't tell my mom anything about this show. <laughs> I, I try to keep her uh, in the dark about this. Uh, I don't want her to be disappointed, Hody. My mom says, sweetie, I want to support you, but I don't want to listen to it. How do I do that? Uh, That's where I'm at with my mom right now. Yeah. Now, uh, you're like the nicest person I've ever met, and you are from Utah, so I'm guessing, are you Mormon? Oh, let's get that out right in the open. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you're just very nice, and uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you around because you're, like, the only nice person involved with We Are Libertarians. <laughs> everybody's been a libertarian for so long and they're just so surly and grumpy. And uh, maybe it's just the people that uh, bir <laughs> birds of a feather attract each other or whatever that phrase is. Um, but and those are the people I've drawn around myself. But Hody is, uh, I I'm giving him the title right now of head of the research team for We Are Libertarians. Yes. So you get a promotion. On air promotion. In your face, Zach. In your face, Zaka, Jacob. <laughs> One of the co-hosts of We Are Libertarians Daily, uh, so you, Sarah Brady Wagner, uh, Ryan Hold, Paul Copeland, Brian Nichols, and uh, you know the Boss Hog guys did one this week. So you're you're pumping out those wall dailies every single, not every single day, because on the days we have the big show, I don't want you crowding out my space. You get the other three days a week. But, um, people have really enjoyed hearing these, and what what I really like about them. Like, for instance, the one with you and Sarah talking about in vitro fertilization, I think that was episode three. That is nothing I have ever considered or thought about, but there's so many different moral and ethical questions wrapped around that subject that it's not something I have on my radar. It's not something that I would be particularly interested in covering, but it's very personal to her, for instance. And so, you know, she knows a lot about it, and that really came through, and there's, like, this great discussion and I think you guys just did uh, an excellent job with that that one in particular I think has been one of my favorites because I was just so surprised like I turned it on I was like thinking I'm not gonna really care so much about but I really did care a lot about the subjects by the end because you did such a great job with it so well I appreciate all, that I, straight yeah. up I, I didn't think it was that interesting either and then you know but Sarah was talking about what she's going through and I think just by having somebody going through it it makes you care more if it's somebody that you care about somebody that you know somebody who feels passionately about it and you know for me i'm a, i'm an egghead like like we're talking about me on the research team I, I do numbers i run numbers i read history books i read a, a lot of very dense things and i'm interested in them they don't always make for great podcasting talk but when you have a personal story to talk about 
especially with the case of Sarah and, and in vitro fertilization, you know, it just makes it that much more lively. We talked about healthcare. Um, I did a two-parter with Paul Copeland recently, and we had a personal story there about um, someone who got a special treatment for migraines, and she had something um, placed in her head to combat the mi migraines, and um, they ended up so not only did they cancel the technology because they said, oh, you know, it's too dangerous. We haven't studied it yet. So they took away her right to try, but they actually illegalized the batteries that go, that go in. in. So it was just one of those, having that personal story, story, we had a bunch of numbers, but that's really what made it special to the audience. And those are what we get the mo most connections on. Well, so for anybody that may be new to We Are Libertarians, um, how do I put this? We're not like other libertarian uh, podcasts <laughs> out there. We're fundamentally different in that I don't do a show for libertarians. If you're a libertarian, um, welcome. I, I consider us to be show prep for the rest of the libertarian movement because we're talking about things that nobody else is talking about. And in such a deep way that we try to cover all the different angles and give you a different viewpoint from not, you know, I'm, I'm the main host of the show, but I also recognize that what I'm interested in may not necessarily connect with you. Um, you know, Harry has taught me that Harry is into so many different things that I don't care about, <laughs> you know, but they're very deep passions of his. And because he has time to kind of bring that stuff out it connects with the audience and, and helps them kind of connect to the libertarian philosophy in a different way. And so that's what we are libertarians daily is about. It's about kind of surfacing some of those other voices that may not get covered here on the show, because as you know, I'm a dictator of this particular uh, space in the we are libertarians universe. What I say goes here on, on the big program. Um, but you know, Hody, I, you can tell the people I don't, I don't, I just post, you know, <laughs> like you guys, I don't necessarily, I'll make suggestions like, hey, the deficit talk may be interesting, but you guys really are the ones coming up with a lot of the topics. You're taking questions from the audience and... I can know. vouch for you. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, you always talk about the IVF episode, and I think that's probably the last one of mine you've listened to. I've had... Yes, that's correct. I've had like 20 uncensored dailies go out, and it's just fantastic because... Just F-bombs. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's so nice in person, but if you listen to the daily, it's just see this and F that and D this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to have some explaining to my bishop to do. Hopefully he's like you and he caught the nice ones and hasn't tuned into any since, you know. No, um, I just listened to the monetary theory one uh, yesterday. So, and I thought that was interesting too. But uh, yeah, I, 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 so I do listen. I, I have not listened I, I just, to every single one yet. Chain. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Because here's the thing. There's, uh, you know, I, I'm sure most of our listeners are like picking and choosing. So I've done some of that too. But um but but yeah, I th I think if you're out there and you're going, I've got a really big question that I want answered. I've got a tough question that I'm facing. Uh, write us a note at editor at weirdlibertarians.com. We'll talk about it here on the show or the Wall Daily folks will cover it. Um, that's the point is we want to talk about uh, what we do here at Weird Libertarians is talk about current events from a very human perspective. So we're relatable to you. You know, we're not talking about we're not talking about theories that really interest. I've, I will be honest. Uh, I, I sacrifice for people, Hody. I really give and I give and I give. It's a sacrifice to not be liked by most of the other libertarian podcasters. Uh, it's a cross I bear to not be liked by a bunch of other nerds. Um, you know, a lot of our fellow podcasters out there do great work. I love Lions of Liberty, Johnny Rocket, uh, and his entire network, Launchpad Media, uh, I even like Roger Paxton at Lava Flow. Uh, obviously, I listen to Tom Woods almost every day, The Reason Podcast almost every day. A lot of those are great podcasts. They talk about libertarian philosophy, but what we're, what we're positioning ourselves a little bit differently is that we're trying to answer the tough questions that you face in your daily life. So it's a two-way street. If you're thinking about something and you're just like, I want to be a libertarian, but I can't get past this one thing then please send us an email at editor at weirdlibertarians.com or go and leave us a voicemail memo on speakpipe at weirdlibertarians.com and we'll answer it. Um, because what we're trying to do here is just, um, it's libertarianism for normal people. So, so we're trying to help, what we're trying to do is talk about current events and then wedge libertarianism in there. And so eventually you go, holy crap, I think I'm a libertarian. So it's very sneaky what we're doing here. But uh, hopefully you find it interesting. And this is not a, a one-way street. We want to be interactive with you. So please, 
um, help us guide some of that content and leave us a note. Now, yeah. Hody, uh, Hody makes up a research team. You know, we have probably, we're the only podcast I would imagine that has a research team. We've got half a dozen people that, you know, serve on the staff of, we, we have, uh, I'm not always consistent, but I try to be consistent. Uh, and so Sundays we get together and talk about the week ahead and what I'm going to talk about. And they'll do some research for me. You know, Hody's been working on some World War One stuff that we're going to talk about in the second show this week. Uh, he put together some research for this show. Um, and, 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 we, and if you want to join that, then please, by all means, editor at wearelibertarians.com. Uh, if, instead of arguing with people that you really aren't converting on your Facebook page, why don't you why don't you come serve under Hody? He's he's a brutal taskmaster. I can tell you that. Um, he, I just got my power, and I am super prepared to abuse it. So. I've seen you mute like five people already. Uh, already, already done. I don't I don't care to hear. I know. Something. So never mind. I don't I don't want Reinhold communisting up this podcast. Yeah, this I don't need Reinhold podcast. bringing his socialism. And oh, my name's Reinhold. I believe the narrative. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I, you, you're yeah. starting on it, and I want to finish the thought about how how a lot of podcasts don't have a research team, and frankly, it's because they don't need it. You find a lot of libertarian podcasts. I would say about half of them fall into the interview category. Right. And if you have an interview, well, that person has to do all the research. I just ask general liberty questions. Is this a good path for liberty? Is this, you know, just just empty-headed? And not that there's anything wrong with it. I, I would I would counter that because I don't want any of our friends to get offended. It's not empty-headed because you do when you do an interview, you've got to read their book or you've got to sketch out some questions. There is an art to an interview, and I think guys like jo Johnny and um Brian Nichols uh, Brian Nichols, yep. Johnny, Mark Claire, those guys ask really good questions and do their homework. And it's the reason we promote them. And then, you know, Rogers, his own research team, he does a show every two weeks and he's very well researched in what he puts out. And that's why I brought Brian onto the network. That's why, you know, we have the network that shows that we have. And then also I promote their networks is because those guys actually put in a lot of the work, but yeah. Sure. So, so I want to, I want to put that caveat in there because I don't want it to come across like we're sure. slamming those other shows. I'm Yes, they do great work. They read a lot. They are very intelligent people. I'm not going to put myself like, I'm lucky. If it weren't for the internet, I might be the dumbest person you know. But I, because I can look up anything online and I have the patience to do it, that, that's kind of what my edge is. Right. But I think the thing about, our, about the We Are Libertarians Network specifically is we'll deep dive into a subject and we get really into history. We get really into... And it's the same host every time. It's you talking about it. And so because of that, you can't just know everything off the top of your head. Well, Hody. <laughs> well, I mean, not to, not, to, uh, not to undermine what you've got going on. I may, know not, I may not know all of the information, but I will never be in doubt that I'm right. Right. <laughs> well, thankfully, with the research team, to finish your thought, you can now always know that you're right. And, uh, you know, I put a lot of work into those research notes, and I take a lot of pride in in saying that anything you hear on this network that's come from the research team has been, you know, researched, you can find notes to it, you can find links to it. And that's what makes, I, I think it just makes for, it's a lot of extra work, but it makes for a much more trustworthy podcast, which I, I don't know if you're like me, but you, you hear a podcast where somebody gave you some faulty facts and you start spouting it off in your office room and then you, you, you find out you're wrong and feel stupid. Yeah. So, so first, we want to tell the new people, here's what we're about. Because after elections, we always get a ton of new people listening to the program and uh, people who are curious about what is going on uh, with various podcasts, with the Libertarian Party, with the Libertarian Movement. Check out our website. We have a ton of resources, a guide to the Libertarian Movement, a guide to what is libertarianism, lots of stuff at wearelibertarians.com for you to check out libertarianpodcasts.com is not something that I mention a lot, but we've got all of the libertarian podcasts I can find. Uh, I want to promote as many libertarian podcasts of, of broad thought as possible. And you know what's funny is a lot of people don't share that list because they see the one podcast on there they don't like. They're like, ooh, that person's there for, ooh. And so they won't share it because there's one impure person on there as opposed to sharing it for the thousands of other shows that are on that list. So don't be selfish. Share that, share that list, please. Uh, and, and I am Chris Spangle. I am the host of the show. I've been here uh, for, we've been doing this for almost six years, I think. 
2012? Yeah, so no, it'll be almost seven years. Holy cow. It doesn't seem like that long. We've had many different iterations of the show. Um, we've, we've tried a bunch of different experiments over the course of our 328 episodes to kind of find the right balance, and we're always trying to improve and do things differently. We are, we are supported by Patreon. So if you get something from this podcast, if you have an aha moment when you listen to our shows and you're like, wow, I never thought about that subject at all. I never thought about that subject in that way. I never knew that fact about this thing I care about then please donate on Patreon because that's how we stay funded. That's how we buy all the equipment. That's how we buy all the software that goes into it. Uh, and uh, so that's a little bit about what we're about and how you can get involved if you want to help. We'd love to, to have you uh, join us because, you know, there's people on the research team, Hody. Um, there's people that are more left, left-leaning in their cultural bias, I guess. I'm more probably conservative leaning in my bias. And there's always a little tension there that is really, really helpful to kind of make sure that you're seeing it from a bunch of different ways. There's, you know, people who are in the military, there's people who are new to the philosophy. And, and so like you, you just get like a little group of people who are coming from a bunch of different perspectives and trying to figure out the same subject from a bunch of different ways. And it's very helpful. So, so that's really what the program is about is trying to inform you make you sound smarter with your friends when you're talking to them. And uh, so that's a little bit of w- what we're about. And um, yeah, so Hody, thank you for all that you have done over the last couple months. You've been a breath of fresh air along with Sarah and Reinhold and, uh, and uh, several others, uh, Zach, Jacob, uh, and everybody on the research team. I really appreciated all of your hard work. Of course. Well, and to throw a little Ayn Rand objectivism, we're using you as much as you're using us. You know, here I am on the main show sharing my research. I've gotten a ton of friend requests and building up my social media block and uh, getting my research out there and talking about the philosophies of liberty, some invitations to speak and some, you know, invitations to run for local office, you know, but, (laughs) you know, there's a lot to be gained by being a part of this for us as well. So I I don't want you to feel like, oh, I have to pull on these guys for more free research stuff. You know, we we're, we're happy to do it. I know it's helpful to you. It's helpful to us. And that's capitalism, baby. Yeah. So very good. All right. Well, uh, speaking of objectivism, I watched the Atlas Shrugged boomies over the weekend. Have you ever seen those? I have. They're on the uh, they're on Amazon Prime. A- A- Atlas Shrugged One was okay. Atlas Shrugged Two was almost good. Uh-huh. And then Atlas Shrugged Three was so incomprehensible. It was the worst movie I have ever seen in my lifetime. It was abysmal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I believe it went straight to video. I mean, it, you're 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 not looking at anything syndicated, well. <laughs> Ooh, but no, the story. I've never read the book. I'm I'm, I'm I guess I'm a bad libertarian, but like I really do like the story and the concept. Mm-hmm. I would say of going galt, of just checking out. I've I've since that I've all week long I've just been applying that to different things. I'm like, you know what? That's kind of smart. And, and, and if you don't know the Atlas Shrug story, it's basically Dagny Taggart. Taggart, yes, Taggart owns a railroad company. the The U.S. government has gotten more and more overbearing in uh, in its um, in its regulations on business. Uh, she runs this big railroad company, and she's constantly fighting with the crony capitalists to get things done. And then all of the people that she works with that are at the top of society just start disappearing. And eventually you find out that this guy named John Galt just basically came in and uh, tempted everybody to Galt's Gulch where they just say, I'm not going to deal with the hassle of dealing with an overbearing government that steals from me. I'm just going to check out. It's your problem. You're not going to use my genius, my efforts, and I'm, I'm just going to go away and start my own society over. And, uh, and f- fun and frivolity uh, ensues. But it is, Hody, I think that there is a lot of that where, and I, you know, I listened to um, a little bit of Roger's show about voting and this election and his recap, and it's just like, there, it's a waste of time. You know, a, a lot of anarchists just don't believe in voting, period, and, and checking out. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have that same kind of mindset where it's just like, you know what, I'm not going to participate in a system that doesn't benefit me or my freedom, so why, I'm just going to check out. Sure. So I think uh, in keeping with the whole anti-purity test bit, I believe that you are there is good points to be made on both sides, and I don't really have an absolutist position. Uh, I believe that personally, so let's talk personally, I respect both sides. I 
I believe it's worth fighting for. I would be the I would be the Dagny Taggart of the books who fights until the bitter end, until the whole thing collapses around her. And uh, the reason being is I see I look at Lincoln in the third party era um, when he said, "Look, we're around. We're around. You might not pick us, but we're around. You might not vote for us, for, but we're around." And when the nation came to disaster, you know, a, a, our, our union dissolved, brink of civil war. That's when they said, fine, we're going to do what you guys have to do. Because regardless of how many people were, people were registered in those parties, they said, you guys are the ones that have been talking about this all along, that slavery was always going to be a problem, that this dissolution was always going to be a problem. You guys have the solutions. So I find as libertarians, if we stay on the forefront of these issues and these policies, I mean, how long have we been saying the drug war is bad when that's unpopular? How long have we been supporting gay marriage, even when that was unpopular. If we stay on the forefront of those issues when the nation finds itself, and you know, who knows what that disaster will be, whether social or economic, take your pick. But when we find ourselves in the brink of disaster, I think they're going to have to give libertarians a chance. That's yeah, I also would argue that I, I get the idea of checking out and not being a part of a system that is inherently oppressive, which if, if you're new to libertarianism, you'll hear people talk about you shouldn't vote because it just furthers this system of oppression and it's it's uh you're you're giving moral license to something that is morally wrong right uh and i don't necessarily agree with that because i want to be involved if something is going to coerce me then i want to at least have some hand in guiding the coercion and i also think there there's something to be said for being the one like you said standing up and saying hey i'm a part of this yeah. uh, and so, you know, for instance, my, um, I got a note on Instagram, and this is like the most adorable thing. I won't say who it is. Hey, Chris, uh, I'm very into politics, and I'm conservative, and my grandma, blank, was over today, and she showed me your podcast, and she said you are her dad's brother's daughter's son, so you are her second co cousin, I'm pretty sure. But anyways, I rarely ever find people to debate, and I'm only 13, but I've recently debated a 20-year-old, and I beat them. And I was wondering what controversial things you stand for because I watched your podcast, but a lot of them weren't informative on if you were and then list off a bunch of different things. And, you know, so here's a person who has just a vague awareness in my family that I do a podcast. Uh, you know, she's a boomer. She's probably never listened to the show. She's probably not a libertarian. But, you know, when her 13 year old grandson starts talking about politics, she's like, hey, I know somebody that you could talk to. It's your cousin. You should go check this out because he talks a lot about this stuff. You know, I'm, I'm always the guy in my family that says, hey, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? Or people at work come up and go, hey, I know you're political. What do you think about X, Y, and Z? And I think that if you're not engaged in the, in the process and talking about the things that people care about, not the things that we as libertarians care about, but the things that voters care about, then I think you're going to miss the point. And I think that was really the message of this election. And I think that's the danger, especially for Republicans going ahead, uh, because they're talking about they're they're sort of manufacturing things that people care about. But, you know, so so I wanted to start with if you should vote at all or not. Uh, and and I think we've both kind of made a case there, unless you've got anything else that you want to say. You know, I, I do, and I want to be fair to, to those who, who are anti-vote. Uh, part of what, and I know what Roger Paxson would say, is it, is it validates the legitimacy of the state by saying, even if I said no to a marijuana law, that's me participating in a process where they can take away my marijuana or allow me to have marijuana. And so it's a matter of rights. And then I, I believe you had a recent uh, reading of Spooner, and uh, Spooner actually has an, Lysander Spooner has a really interesting view on this subject. Uh, it, it, we're caught between two absolutes with it, which is you should totally participate, you should totally not participate. And he was actually very like uh, middle ground. He said it, it's, it's appropriate to vote on something that impacts you and people who are living and only those people who vote, but it's not okay to vote for something that's going to carry over to your posterity or carry over to somebody who was not involved in that vote. Just something, I, I, food for thought to think about while we discuss it. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, very good. Uh, I was just looking at the chat, and poor poor Reinhold's like, ah, I can't even respond because yeah. Reinhold's in the chat, Paul's in the chat, and uh, we were teasing them. That's why. That's why I was doing it. You were teasing, and you weren't able to respond. Uh, Reinhold is a very dear friend and uh, gets teased in the group chat in the in the big group, which you can join at WeLibertarians.com for being a socialist. But he's completely not. He's just a 
he's just a, a orthodox libertarian, but he gets hated on. Uh, so what we want to do for the rest of the night is kind of recap what happened in this election. Uh, we've got uh, obviously what happened in the Senate. We've got what happened in the House. We've got what happened in governor's races. I want to go through some of the exit polling uh, and, and give you kind of a snapshot of where the American people are. Uh, we've got a bunch of libertarian races that we followed. We've got a bunch of pollsters that we followed. So we've got a lot that we can talk about. We've got a lot of lessons from this election, a lot of lessons for libertarians. Uh, you know, and so let's maybe start with the libertarians because I think people hear so much about Republicans and Democrats and the House and the Senate, and they don't hear a lot about what happened with the libertarians and what are some of those lessons. Uh, so let's start with the libertarians, Hody, and let's actually um, give – Let's converse a little bit about some of these races. I've got an article from 71 Republic that I think needs a response. Yep. Uh, and uh, about the effectiveness of the Libertarian Party. So let's start there. And so you put together a big board, a big board of different races that we were monitoring. It was all in our show notes posted on midterm day. I put together the biggest board. Correction. Nope. Honestly, yeah. your board was so much bigger than, you know, Lindsay Marie's, for instance. Very tiny board. Yes. That's very important to me as a man. I, uh, I, I need the biggest board. But, yeah, we you have a board bigger than a woman, Hody. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, go, you know, MAGA, go Trump. Anyway, uh, masculinity, proud boys, all that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. We, fo we followed a lot. Uh, I think one of the cool parts about having that big board is we were able to, able to follow like all the toss ups, uh, the notable libertarians. We actually took contributions for which ones we should follow um, and got some interesting results. I, full disclosure, I worked on like four of these campaigns and submitted some everything from speeches to slogans to, and unfortunately I don't, I don't think I work on any that broke 2%. So I'd, I'd love to brag about my effectiveness, but uh, maybe I, well, now that I've illegitimized myself. Yeah. Let's so it's, they say it's how, it's not how big your board is. It's how effective you are. And um, <laughs> not good, Hody. The firepower is lacking. Yeah. So what was the first, what was the first race that we were following? Everybody wanted to talk about Larry Sharp. Right. That, that's the most notable for us nationwide was Larry Sharp. Okay. 1.6% uh, of the vote, very distant behind Mark Molinaro, the Republican, very distant behind Andrew Cuomo, Democrat, King Cuomo. Uh, you had a bit that I think is important to recognize that his 90,000 votes was 80,000 above where the last libertarian candidate right. was in New York. And, I saw uh, so many, I saw so many libertarians crapping on that campaign as if Larry Sharp somehow did a bad job. But here's my, my frustration with libertarians doing post an election analysis of their own party or God forbid Republican leaning libertarians just looking for reasons to crap on the libertarian party which none of you people are helpful. Like if your goal is to just talk negatively uh, all the time about any libertarians efforts or a group of libertarian efforts, like one of our principles here, I'm certainly ha have talked ill of other libertarians individually. Um, it, 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 you know, for instance, uh, former LNC chair candidates, for instance, but by and large, by in, in general, I just, you know, Hey, I have how I want to advance libertarianism. I do a podcast network. I put my time into that. Other people are really good activists. Other people are really good at being activists in the Republican Party. Other people are really good at doing X, Y, or Z. It's what you do to advance the cause of libertarianism. It's not, is everybody else doing the right thing or not? And so I think people want to force their version of activism on other people. And I just think that's completely wrong and it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, you know, I... I will even there, there are plenty of people that, Hey, I'll tell you about them. Even if I don't necessarily personally like some of those people, because they may be your taste. Uh, so I, I look at this and I go, I don't, I just hate these people who after every election who are libertarians, who are looking for reasons to just S all over the libertarian party. And this, this time around, it was Larry Sharp that got the, the majority of the dumping what you have to understand is when you do that, you think you're looking cool to a certain group of your libertarian friends, but to all your friends and family, 
who knew of Gary Johnson or who knew of Larry Sharp, you look like a total a-hole and you make the entire movement like, oh, okay, they're just dysfunctional. I'm not going to join them. You know, so a lot of people are libertarians now because they supported Gary Johnson and they didn't know all the finer points of his ideology. And then when you come along and you're just like, I'm the chair of this libertarian party and I hate Gary Johnson. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll just go back to being a Republican then. So you really turn people off. And so I looked at the, at the Larry Sharp race, Hody, and here's a guy who got ballot access for his state and he got 80,000 more votes than the last LP candidate. And all anybody can focus on is that he got a 0.1 percentage less than the Green Party candidate in New York. <laughs> yeah, well, and the Green Party candidate was what, in, like endorsed by the Cynthia Nixon crowd after she dropped out and lost the primary to Cuomo, right? right. So, I mean, the, the, you need to put it all in perspective. And the Green Party did not do well compared to us in most other races across the nation. And so this is this is New York, like you said. This is 80,000 people we didn't have before. And honestly, even if you don't think it was the, it's the best use of time to try and make a showing in politics, that's 80,000 people that are willing to show up. And even if you don't believe in voting or like it, that are willing to show up and do something for a libertarian that, weren't, that didn't before. And that's got to mean something to you as far as growing the idea of liberty, even if you don't like the Libertarian Party or you don't wish to participate. Uh, I, I, it drove me crazy as well. I think there's no reason to cut anybody else down if they're advancing Libertarian philosophy. And, and Larry Sharp was, is such a good guy. He's so good for the party. And, and so if, he's if in you a have... major, Yeah, he's in a major, major media market. He was on um, Ebro in the Morning, which is the major black talk radio station uh, it's a, it's hot. I think it's hot 100 in, in New York. It's like one of the biggest urban stations. It's one of the biggest radio stations, period, yep. in New York. And he was on Ebro in the morning. I saw it in Indianapolis. You know, he was on uh, Joe Rogan. He was on um, Glenn, Beck. Glenn Beck. He was on Dave Rubin. He was on, all, because he's in a major media market, mm -hmm. he got a ton of attention in a major media market. And even if those people didn't pull the lever, they at least heard libertarian for the first time from somebody who is who almost universally everyone agrees Larry Sharp is a libertarian. He does a great job. He's great at messaging. His philosophy is pure enough. You know, I mean, even Roger Paxton can't really say anything bad about Larry Sharp. And so what is the what is the virtue of trying to look cool by crapping on this guy when you don't understand the realities of that race? This is New York State, a fundamentally a liberal state. Mm -hmm. He got he got one point six percent. But in some of those more conservative areas upstate, he was getting five percent in counties. He was yeah. making major inroads in more conservative areas. But New York City, obviously, you're going when you have Ocasio Cortez who gets elected overwhelmingly in her district in Queens. It's it's a left, it's a blue state, it's a heavily blue state. So of course they're going to be more favorable to the green candidate, yeah, and, and green candidate issues than libertarian issues. Uh, so I just look at it and go, this was a complete win for libertarians. Larry Sharp did such an excellent job representing the philosophy and the party. In, in a major media outlet, and those 80,000 people are new volunteers, new donors, new candidates, new listeners to podcasts, new, new uh, readers of Reason Magazine. Like, those are people who are now kind of awakened to the libertarian movement, and you're actually hurting the movement by crapping on the guy that is bringing new converts into the movement. Yeah, and, and, and he is... Not only good for the movement, he's good for you personally. I think a lot of people feel personally affected by the the campaign that Larry Sharp ran was very much, let me see your business, let's run some numbers, let's figure out what your business would look like afterwards. Um, I guess I'll just kick things forward a little bit because I could talk about Larry Sharp all day. Okay. Of course, it's disappointing that he didn't win. His rhetoric was all about winning. He wanted to win. And libertarians really should use that philosophy. We don't want to go into it saying we're spoilers. We want to go, go into it being real solutions because we are real solutions. Yeah, the other thing that I would say about the, the analysis of some people about Larry Sharp is okay. there, people don't recognize that there are two libertarian parties. There are the libertarian party people that are actually doing the work, that are actually running campaigns, that are actually knocking on doors, that are actually running for office, that are actually donating – and then there's the Libertarian Party that's on Facebook. 
And those people have never knocked on a door. They've never run a campaign. They've never been candidates for an office. They've never been committed to the cause whatsoever. They just want to criticize from the sidelines and say, I'm a libertarian and I'm more pure than them. And somehow that is just, that is just all that they do. And so what a lot of these people is like, uh, they've, they've never been involved in politics, period. You know, you, you look at some of these people, they're usually very young or they're just people who've never been in, the, in any political movement, have no political experience. And so they just see him in their echo chamber, like getting on TV all the time. Austin Peterson's kind of been a victim of this where, oh, uh, there's no way Austin's not going to win. And then he doesn't win. He actually does fairly poorly. And it's because they ran media campaigns. They were running marketing campaigns. And what, what people who aren't a part of the party don't understand is there are two types of candidates. There's candidates that are going to win, that are going to run to win. And those are candidates that are running on a very small scale level, a county council race, uh, a township board race. And then there's the marketing campaigns that regular voters that everybody like your friends and family who aren't into this, like we are into it. Those are the ones that they care about the Senate, the house races, the governor's races, the presidency, you know, the, the people that your friends and family would ask about, those are the marketing races. Those are not, you're not, the party's not going to win those like flat out. Like it's, it's delusional to think that you're going to win in the, the governor's race in New York state because they have, had 250 years of figuring out how to screw us out of access to the ballot, to the ballot box with gerrymandering, with straight ticket voting, with, with all kinds of uh, incentives to, to put themselves up in a position of, uh, it's the incumbent protection system essentially. So until we get a lot of those laws fixed, so instead of turning the gun around and saying, it's the libertarian party's fault that they don't win, why don't you turn it around and say it's it's the election law's fault that we don't win? Let's change that. Uh, and so I, I really am disappointed in the way that people reacted to Larry Sharp's numbers because I think a lot of them weren't realistic about them or they're just festering a holes, Hody. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with, uh, uh, in fairness to some of those people, to the to a portion. One is his rhetoric was we can win this, so let's win this. But I would say to those people, like, he could have won if people just listened or if people just paid attention to what's going on within the state, you know, uh, to put the Lincoln analogy forward. I mean, a lot of people were saying, you know, Republicans have no chance of winning this, no chance of winning this, no chance of winning this until finally disaster occurs. You know, right. we take the temperature in New York and says, is this disaster for you? They told us, no, we're not, we don't feel that we're in a disastrous place yet. We'll just wait. It keeps getting worse. And so there's no reason to, to freak out yet. It's too bad it wasn't Larry Sharp this time. But in, you know, 10, 20 years, four years, I mean, the way New York's going, maybe it will be Larry Sharp. And I'll give you other reasons for libertarians uh, to, to feel hopeful after this election yeah. later on. But if I filibuster the whole time, Hody, we won't get through anything. So let's, get, <laughs> let's uh, go through some of these numbers. Up next was Gary Johnson in New Mexico. 15.4%. So that's big. Uh, our best uh, Senate candidate before that was uh, Joe Miller from two years in Alaska, 29.14%. Uh, so about half of that. But it's over half of what the Republican got. Of course, it's in a state where he used to be the governor. You was, know, he's... was Joe Miller in a two-way or a three-way? Oh, that's a good question. I thought he was in a three-way. Oh, you know what? He was in the two-way, but uh, wasn't Mullinowski the write-in candidate that year? Uh, Mur Murkowski, yeah. Murkowski, yeah. Murkowski. Yeah, the, the Libertarian gubernatorial candidate in Alaska got around 13%, which we'll get to that. But yeah, yeah. Gary had a really, really strong number that's a historical number. Yeah. I mean, that's 15% is halfway to victory. Uh, you only have to get to 33%. But um, yeah, it is. this is a little more disappointing because here's a guy who was elected as a Republican twice, and then he's on the ballot again, and people uh, give him 15% instead of 50%. And so you literally have the same man, different label, yep. and people just vote with uh, the team. And so that, that is – it's not on Gary Johnson, although he kind of I, – I didn't see a lot about him uh, and his race kind of leading up to Election Day. So I, I don't know how seriously they ran or how hard they ran. I, don't, I just didn't pay attention. I'm not being accusatory, but – that's where if you think his campaign manager would have read something that would have grabbed your attention, right? 
Yeah, you know, you'd think that maybe they would lead, reach out to the third or fourth largest libertarian podcast, but that's okay. That's yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Our next, you know, our next yeah. guest did. <laughs> you know, that leads me, and I'm going to go out of order here a little bit, but that actually leads me to Laura Ebke, okay. um, who is somebody else that got elected in her state, changed her label, and then and then lost, although I will say for her, now this is state senate. This isn't, you know, U.S. Senate, but 43.68%. Um, it was a two-way race. But that's an amazing number for a local race. Still, they elected her just fine when she had the Republican label. And then lost the label, kept all the values, and then she loses. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's very similar, uh, very but, similar there. But still, 43 in a two-way race for a Libertarian Party candidate, that's still outstanding. And I bet if she yeah. ran again, she may, she may pull it out. Yeah. Because what, what people don't understand is that, yeah, okay, the, we can have this comparison of same person, different label, they lost, but it matters the environment that they're running in. It matters what the turnout is. It matters what the district, if it's the same. It matters if people have a certain attitude towards one candidate, like the hatred towards Trump really propelled a lot of people or the love for, for Trump. You know, so a lot of those external factors, that could be 52% next time. In, in different, in different uh, you know, she ran in a presidential year where you've got a really well-run presidential campaign, you know, like Hody for president, then, Ooh. then you know, they can have coattails that can kind of help pull that out. So, you know, it, it is easy to say, oh, different person, different thing, but it does kind of matter some of those other fundamentals for us, even as much as it matters. You know, if it matters in these close races for Senate, in the R's and D's races, it, it matters for us too. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, inching closer. I think people forget, they look at, you know, sometimes we have great years, you know, Gary Johnson was, and I know people think it could have been better, but it was a great year for us Two wildly unpopular presidential candidates, you know? And, and so, so we made some strides forward. I think we're hoping to see that progress, but I think it's also important to recognize we actually didn't slip back as much as we could have either. Libertarians tend to do better with unpro during presidential elections. This was not one. And during a uh, time when, you know, both presidential options, are pretty bad uh in this case not a presidential election go ahead i i've never seen you know numbers like this and, and i mean so many different candidates mm -hmm. that were so worth worth your time watching or donating uh, and and they got good results like it, it is uh it, it is kind of like a growing thing where you're looking at this going wow there's a lot of really good candidates that ran this year yeah. And, and they're great candidates and people are starting to recognize that. And I think having not slipped from, from two years ago is, is, should be considered a win that we're getting, we're, we're seeing similar numbers compared to what we got, ha having no libertarian president running, ha you know, and so we're actually dealing, we're actually seeing a lot in these numbers while we say, oh, you know, they're kind of the same as what we saw two years ago. Even maintaining that foothold is huge this year to say that those people that joined us two years ago are still here. Think about that. Yeah. So, and for those who are like, oh, they're just sucking the LPs D like, trust me, the hard medicine's coming. The, for those of you who love balance, I will uh, say some very mean things about the Libertarian Party coming soon and some hard truths. So uh, watch for that. So, so let's go to, let's go to Indiana. You know, here in Indiana, we have straight ticket voting. We're one of eight states. And uh, you know, from the time that the polls opened at 6 AM, Jeremiah Morrill, was mathematically, he, he couldn't win. The Republican had 39% of the vote already. By the time they started, vote, because people just voted in straight ticket numbers here mm -hmm. in a way that they've not voted in a very long time, straight ticket voting was up 10% here in Indiana from 2008. Uh, if you look at Lucy Brenton in the Senate, uh, she got 3.9%. She got around five or a little over five in uh, two years ago in the same race. Mark Rutherford, who ran a stellar race for Secretary of State, he was at 3.2%, so the LPIN gets ballot access, but that's down from 6% as, as, a, as a high. We were, we were getting 5 or 6% in that race, and now we're down to 4 And then Jeremiah Morrill, the boss hog, which we posted a daily podcast, uh, an excerpt as he talked about straight ticket voting and the, the ballot boxes that were completely uh, screwing him and didn't work there, and he got 12%, which does put him in the top 10 of results here in Indiana LP history. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, he, uh, as you wrote here, he took 1% more from Republicans and 11% more from Democrats than District 2. He is running against a very weak Democratic candidate, but very, very strong race. But straight ticket voting completely screwed these three candidates. Um, Lucy Brenton, uh, if you look at the exit poll for Indiana, she proved, if you go to CNN's exit poll, and let me give you, uh, I'll put this in the show notes. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the exit polls, so exit polls are very, very, very solid in terms of their data because they're done in mass and they're done in person. And so you've got 2,300 respondents to these. And when you go to party ID it, and they say, were you a voter for Donnelly? Were you a voter for Braun who ended up winning the Republican or are you a voter for Brenton? Uh, Lucy got 2% of Democratic votes and 2% of Republican votes, and then Independent said 9%. So out of the 98% or out of 96% of the people who voted for Lucy Brenton were not Republicans or Democrats, and she split Republicans and Democrats at 2%. And it can, and so let's back this up with another number. Ideology, are you a liberal, moderate, or conservative? Brenton pulled 6% of liberals and 2% of conservatives. So that's only 8% of her, of, of her percentage there. Uh, and, and that may not actually, it may not be 90, but, it, but it's still a very low percentage of people who identify with those other parties because, you know, 86% of liberals voted with Braun, uh, Donnelly, 88% with Braun. So, and there's a couple other numbers in here. We've posted this on our social media. Hody, when you actually look at the empirical evidence of straight ticket voting, we draw evenly at very minuscule numbers. And it just shows you that choice, the more choice you offer, the more people participate in the system. Yeah, well, thanks to Gary Johnson's campaign, we kind of got to look at kind of what some of the straight ticket was, was about because they attempted to put that back on the as an option in New Mexico. Uh, let's not, and Jeremiah Morrill, bless his heart, was a lot nicer about this than I would have been. Straight t ticket voting has a very racist history, and it is designed by people hoping that you are illiterate. What is and that? What is that history? So, um, actually, they had a case in Michigan about it. A lot of the history there was because they wanted to keep, uh, if they kept blacks off of the ballot or people who were black sympathists off of the ballot, it was much easier to vote. You know, you do a straight ticket Republican because you're illiterate, but you know, you don't like the darkies. And so right. you'd vote straight ticket Republican and you just hit, hit a button. It'd fill out all the Republican slots for you. Or, you know, in that day and age, you know, you'd, you'd punch a hole or whatever a chad you know yeah. here, here <laughs> in Indiana, the ballot we have three pictures next to the straight ticket voting and they're called yeah. ballot devices you know ours is a statue of liberty the elephant and a chicken and the reason the democrats are a chicken is that back in the day before people could read the democrats would you want to vote for the democrats and they'd hold up a chicken and then people would know okay if you couldn't hear then you see the chicken go up and you raise your hand yeah that's straight ticket voting <laughs> that's and so there's that's the history of it right and so we're almost done with it Right. We get down to the states eliminated. Right. About nine. We get down to about nine states. And then a couple of states this year look at, looked at putting it back, uh, Michigan and New Mexico, to put it back. And you just say, well, well, the whole point of it is to just say, I'm I'm stupid and I really want to keep black people off the ballot. So I guess I'm going to vote straight ticket. You know, for the guys who, who's against the darkies, you guys can okay, vote for you guys, right. you know, all the way. And so that's the history of straight ticket voting. And so so it's, it's got that racist history. Now, obviously, race didn't play a part in this Indiana race, but it's it, that's the whole that's the history behind it. So why would we try to put it back now that we're in an area where people are more literate, where we're becoming more diversified on the issues and we're learning more to put something back that just says, I believe in whatever all of the Republicans say to believe i believe in whatever all the democrats say to believe it, right. it's absurd uh all right so who 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 is interesting to you next um oh Trent? looking down here well i did want to talk on this and this is not one of the ones we were following but we actually did set a record for governor votes in alaska this year billy toeen uh in a three-way race 15.8 percent of the vote uh, again, like you said, that's halfway to what we need, and that is a governorship. So while we looked at um, 
some of these ones I kind of don't want to talk about, we can, but like Mets was a little disappointing. Larry Sharp, we already talked about that was a little disappointing, you know, um, you know, some of the guys that hovered around one, two, three percent, Kansas governor, uh, Jeff Caldwell ran a great campaign, even finished behind the independent. He was at 1.8%. The independent got 6.5%. Um, yeah, we will, we will put the, all the candidates that we followed, we'll put these uh, in the show notes. I want to shout out to a wall listener and friend of the program, Danny Lundy, 17, yeah. 17.52% ran against three Republicans. He was in a four-way race and got 17%. Uh, so congratulations to him. Yeah. The, and, and a lot of these, I mean, because of, we had a, we followed a lot of local ones because we have a lot of those people who actually listen to the show and the show's important to them. And so, you know, we had a Shreveport city council at 6.5%, um, some fun ones there, but uh, anyway, stick to my point. Uh, Billy Toine actually setting a record as far as governor goes for a libertarian party candidate, 15.8%. I think that's amazing because he was not, in the news, that whole governor's race was not actually well polled. Um, one of the things when we do get to the polling, which we will talk about later, uh, they did not do major polling in Alaska. And so they threw him up as toss ups because nobody knew. Like we just were like, I don't know, it could be a blowout, it could be close, but because we didn't do any major polling, we have no idea. And so it's something to consider that maybe libertarians do better when there's not this tribal mentality of saying well it looks like most people are going to vote this way or vote vote this way if you actually just don't know and vote your conscience suddenly libertarians actually start to do a lot better yeah there this was this was the worst result here in indiana that i've seen in a very long time for libertarians in the 10 years i've been here we've been creeping up and up and up and our base has gone and in, in, in 2008 when i got here it was one to two percent was kind of the base and then our base is now three percent and so to just kind of get the base is rough. And I think you can see that in Georgia, for instance, with Ted Metz. He, got, he only got 0.9%. Um, he he uh, didn't end up cr creating a runoff. Kemp broke, as of now, 15. We still don't know if, who's the winner in that race or in um, Mississippi. And, Kemp's going to win that race. Yeah, Maybe. Kemp's going to win. There's also Florida is still in a recount situation and Mississippi is still in a recount situation, but the Republican is, they're going to have a runoff and miss is it's Alabama. I think actually, I'm sorry. Alabama yeah. has a runoff, but uh, so yeah, the, so he didn't tip a runoff there as of now, but uh, I, this number from star work is really interesting. Yeah. And he created a runoff in his race. So, so it's uh, who he is. Uh, so Nicholas Sarwark is the uh, chair of the Libertarian Party. Uh, he was he had a well, it wasn't his fault, but there was a pretty contentious race for him rerunning for chair. I figured he'd have had enough at that point, but then he immediately was like, "Okay, now that I've reelected chair, I'm running for mayor for Phoenix." Uh, Eleven point one six percent. This was a four way race. So pulling down 11.16% is pretty good. Uh, he did about half as well as the Republican did, and it created a runoff between the two Democrats. Uh, so he actually did play. We were looking for that spoiler one all night. We actually did get our wish with uh, Sarwark in, in Phoenix to actually create that spoiler in a way that actually kicked the Republican off of the, run, the, the runoff. Uh, so so it's, it's going to make the Democrats choose between two Democrats as far as Mayor Phoenix. Uh, Sarwark also ran a really great campaign as far as let me mow your lawn and tell you about me at the same time. And I think that that is his 11.16% is an impressive start in a major city. And if you're in a smaller city, this is absolutely something you should be looking at. You know, I know Joshua Smith's running for um, mayor of Antioch and, and other cities that are much smaller that you may be able to persuade more of the vote your way as a libertarian but you would absolutely run a, want to run your race the way sarwark ran it you know mow people's lawns shake hands meet them get to know them uh and that was very much what he did was saying can i offer you a lemonade hey by the way i'm nicholas sarwark and he did amazingly yeah uh let's just do a couple more um let's let's go down to perspective uh the best that the Libertarian Party has ever done. Yeah, give give some give people some perspective on that. So we get disappointed with some of our results, but we should understand that a lot of these results are only slightly behind our records. And in the case of the Alaska governor that I already mentioned, we set a record this year. Uh, our record for House was in Kansas in 2012. 
31.55%. That was Joel Balam. Uh, so when you're running for House, that's the standard, 31%. 2% higher and he gets on, sure, but that's our highest that we've ever achieved in the Libertarian Party. Uh, we talked about Joe Miller, again, the two-way kind of three-way race with the write-in, uh, the 29%. The best we've ever done in any single state for president was actually, and you think of Gary Johnson in New Mexico, uh, he pulled a 9% there. It was actually um, Alaska again, Ed Clark in 1980 pulled in 11.66%. The most important one that I can think of as far as running a campaign, if you were to model it, uh, in 2012, this was a statewide office, clerk of the Supreme Court, Mike Fellows pulled down 43.13%. Um, a two-way race, but that's the best we've ever done in an election for a statewide office. And he did it, and Montana's a big state, but he also did it the Sarwark way, or I guess I should say Sarwark did it the Mike Fellows way because he came first, okay. but meeting people, talking with them, figuring out what they cared about, putting their issues on the forefront, you know, and, and actually physically meeting them personally. And in, in Montana, I guess that was something he felt he was physically able to do. 43% the, uh, that's the mark in any race that we've ever done in statewide office. That's the best we've ever done. Okay. Uh, we've mm. only ever achieved one statewide office ever. As a uh, win? Uh, now, we've never actually won an election in a statewide office, but we had one libertarian who was a Republican that switched to libertarian, Commissioner of Public Lands, Aubrey Dunn, uh, and that's the, that's the highest ranking libertarian we've actually ever had in any office. Now, you might say, well, what about Laura Ebke, state senate? This is actually higher than that um, because that is a local race, and this was actually a statewide race. So the Commissioner of Public Lands, Aubrey Dunn, Jr., um, that was somebody who switched. So that's something we shouldn't write off either to consider. Uh, we've had six elected libertarians switch their position from – we've actually had Republicans and Democrats switch – uh, to the Libertarian Party, and that's something that's a win as well, something Sarwark actually uh, tries actively to persuade them to switch their party, and that's another way to get the office. It's a Libertarian. It's in office, you know. It's yeah, just, we were uh, able – we had an Indianapolis City County Councilor, 12th largest city in the nation, switched, and he was at large, and we had the ability to introduce legislation for two years. So, I mean, it was it – was, you know, we had a Libertarian caucus. It was just him. But he was the swing vote on a couple things. So it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And it lets people know, you know, hey, you were voting for a libertarian. They're just finally embracing the title now, just so you know. You know, right. uh, uh, what was it like two weeks after Gary Johnson got elected uh, governor? They said, by the way, you guys don't know it yet. You voted for a libertarian. That was a local newspaper. He didn't say it. But they're like, yeah, everything he's saying, that's libertarian stuff. He just fooled you guys. And <laughs> <laughs> it makes you wonder about that tactic. And I guess that's something that we can talk about a little bit here is running as a libertarian as a Republican or Democrat. How do you feel about that? Uh, having had that experience, you know, the several of the state legislators like Brandon Finney in New Hampshire that switched, they got their butts kicked and uh, yep. that sucks. And I think that if you do switch, I think it was a, it, it is a great experience for whatever time that you have, you do, you, you take minimal amount of people giving you grief because people hate the Republican and Democratic Party so much that they go, nah, I totally get it. I get why you switched. The, o the only people that are really salty about it are the people that were never going to support you anyways. The, it was truly party people, the ward county, the ward chairman or the precinct committeemen. Those people never support you. You know, they didn't probably support you when you were running for office because you were libertarian anyways. Uh, you know, and so what you do is you, if you do switch, you do make a statement. You get uh, a couple years to really um, make an impact on the Libertarian Party brand, and you may not win. So if you're in your final term, then do it. <laughs> switch. Yeah. Uh, and I and I would encourage. I have. Um, I know for a fact that Senator Mike Lee's office has people that listens to this program. They listen to the Brian Nichols program. They listen to uh, We Are Libertarians. So I'm just saying, Mike Lee, come on, dude, please. You know uh, what you are. Come on, right. Mike. Um. All right. So let's let's. We've got a lot to cover, and so we'll put we'll put. I don't want to read you. A, a ton of these numbers, you know, uh, but no, congratulations no. to Boss Hog. They did have two victories there, Hody. They did. 
So uh, we had two Liberty Township trustees, Jamie Jo Owens and Terry Kaufman, congratulations. Uh, registered, ran a great campaign, and uh, soundly defeated their opposition by a score of 100% to 0% <laughs> of the vote. So here in Indiana, we have enough elected officials to fill our football stadium that the, the taxpayers paid for. Uh, we have township government. We have 92 counties, which is way too many. We have nine townships in each one of those counties, and there's trustees and councilmen. And so in, in a lot of these rural areas, there's, there's one party rule from either Democrats or Republicans. And so libertarians are the only alternative party. And so they're the only ones willing to step up and run for some of these township board races. And uh, we, we make it so find the lowest form of government in your city, town, state, local area, county. And I guarantee there's somebody there's some role probably not being filled and you can easily win some of those races and start working your way up. And then when you run for a higher office, hey, I'm the township chairman or I'm the township trustee. Uh, which used to be our form of government charity. You know, the township trustees still, like if you go to them, hey, I need an electric bill paid, I'm down on my luck, and they come over and they see you have a flat screen TV, they'll deny your request for temporary help. They may help you for a couple months, they may buy your kids clothing for school, whatever. You know, uh, it, it, where Purdue is, the township trustee that I heard speak 10 years ago said, you know, we have 900 requests a, a year, but we only grant 250 of them. You know, so it's direct fiscal responsibility. So these, these township trustees offices are perfect offices for libertarians. Uh, no government welfare. Uh, no, but to, seriously, seriously, folks. Um, so, and achievable. Yeah. And I think the LP has been pushing forward that we want paper candidates. Even if you're only willing to be a paper candidate, we may still use you. Now, Terry Kaufman, this is a funny story. Terry Kaufman won because Steve Kaufman, who won that initially in 2010, I believe, had to step down because of nepotism laws because he's a firefighter. So if you work for a town or a government agency, you can't run for office, I guess, now because of a uh, new law that got passed. And so libertarians have been around long enough to finally have uh, people affected by nepotism corruption laws. So live long enough, people. <laughs> you know, see the Libertarian Party go corrupt. Um, Hody, so you did a great work kind of keeping up with that. So I want people to go check that stuff out. It'll be in the show notes along and I'll, I'll put some links in there tomorrow, uh, or today when this gets posted, uh, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com. And we'll, we always put a PDF when we have show notes in there and I'll put some of the other podcasts and, and other things that I kind of saw that caught my eye to get you caught up and uh, up to speed on what happened. But uh, our friends over at 71 Republic, 71, the numbers republic.com, mm -hmm. uh, Matt Geiger runs it. Very smart kid. He's literally 16 or 17. Very, very motivated. Much more efficient and effective than I was at 16. Um, but they have an article that I want that I think needs a response called, Is the Libertarian Party Doomed to Fail? Uh, in the current state, the LP will soon run into problems that have corrupted all political parties. And this was written by a writer named Harley Austin. And uh, he made the mistake of putting this in our group. <laughs> most other libertarian groups, you'd go, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, F the LP. But we're very reasoned and uh, we try to find facts and not just go by our gut. And uh, so uh, Ryan Hold immediately started picking it apart. Um, uh, so I want to read a little bit of this and then we'll respond. In America, those hoping to get rid of government overreach and tyranny have few ways to. Trying to do so using the two major parties, for example, has been an absolute failure. So the next idea was a third party, the LP. While it, this attempt has been ambitious and relatively successful despite low electoral progress, there has been an emergence of the political plagues that ruined all p previous parties. The Libertarian Party is on a track such that should it ever gain success, it will become just as corrupt as the other two parties. Uh, political corruption is not a result of an undereducated voting base or minute problems. Rather, it is a natural byproduct of government itself. This is especially true in a democratic nation where demagoguery and populism can run rampant. With all political parties, the desire to win elections comes before all else. This is why politicians sacrifice principles to gain votes only with those they can win and rule. In order to gain votes from the majority, politicians attempt to appeal to the irrational fears of the majority. If they don't appeal to the mob, then the mob will vote for the other candidate that does and that 
candidate will win. It's no wonder why modern American politics is so full of polarization and mudslinging. Democracies reward that. This is why political parties will always, by their own design, stray from their principles. After all, they need to in order to win. Take a look at the two major parties. There is endless fighting over inflated non-issues and insults, but a lack of principle. The two parties stay in power because they appeal to the destructive populism of the mob. The only way the Libertarian Party can gain major success is to do the same. Give in to the mob rule and abandon Libertarian principles. A political party does not stray from principle because of corrupt politicians or internal bureaucracies, but because political parties require must, they must, uh, they must uh, appeal to those bureaucracies to win, essentially. I, I lost track there for a second. You got this. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, reading is hard. That's um, all right. I'm right there with you. If I don't see how a name's pronounced beforehand, that name's going to get mispronounced. So let me skip down. From here, we can speculate what will happen if the LP does gain control. Like those before it, the LP will probably create a political shakeup during its initial rise. Possibly a major party could fall, but they'd eventually fall to corruption. Um, so, so a lot of it is the impurity argument. Uh, so I think they're inherent in this article. I'm not going to read it all. You can check it out in the show notes. Uh, is, it, it, there are some valid points in here. First off, I think if the Libertarian Party ever did gain power, then it would become corrupt. So what does corrupt mean? And this is kind of what we've been taking a look at in our From the Swamp series, uh, where I talked to a guy who's been in Washington, a fly on the wall. You know, he was the issues director for the H.W. Bush campaign in 80 and, and the Gerald Ford presidential campaign that lost. You know, so here's a guy who's been in Washington, D.C. at high levels for a long time. And uh, taking a look at what corruption is. And here's the thing, we, you know, oh, dirty lobbyists. You know what most lobbyists do? Research. <laughs> and they go and have lunch with a congressman and they show that research to the congressman and hope that they can, uh, can win their favor. You know, and so when we talk about corruption, I think libertarians kind of throw that around. And so he's saying, well, we have to make people fearful. Uh, we have to manipulate the mob by making them fearful. He's saying we shouldn't do that. But he's kind of doing that in this article, Hody, by saying we will fall to corruption but never truly defining what that corruption is either shows that he doesn't know exactly what corruption takes place in Washington, D.C., how it works, or he's just being populist trying to manipulate the mob to either join or not join the Libertarian Party. And so this is one point that I'd like to take, that I'd like to say that we do here on We Are Libertarians, is we try to look at the what actually is happening. What does corruption mean? So, you know, Hody, you've read a lot. I mean, when we talk about corruption in government, I think people think that congressmen are just walking around through the halls of Congress and people are just stuffing $20 bills for ways to, to vote. But that's not exactly how it works. There is corruption, but it's not necessarily in, in the way that people think. Yeah, so corruption is very broad. Uh, a lot of times used as saying, my politician talked to somebody that I didn't want them talking to. Uh, and, and it's not always about financial benefits. In fact, most of the time it is not. So when you look at anti-corruption laws that deal with, you know, I can only donate X amount of money to a campaign, Libertarians are about split on whether there should be limits on that, but that is actually a very small percentage of what you're talking about when we're actually talking about corruption. The majority of corruption actually comes from, uh, I believe, the highest uh, lobbyist group, aside from our own Department of Commerce, by the way. That's mm -hmm. number one by a lot. But the, uh, the people who most bribe out politicians with actual physical money is actually the Real Estate Association, and it goes way beyond real estate. It goes to, well, I'm going to give you this land at this price at this rate, which is way below what it should be at. I'm going to help out some of your business associates in exchange. Maybe you look the other, you know, you, you appoint a commissioner or a an appointee that overvalues the land prices and we get a cut of the, you know, property taxes. It, it's more convoluted than just here. Like you said, here's $20, please vote this way. Here's a thousand dollars, please, please vote this way. And so to actually trace the extent of corruption, you got to get real muddy. I find all of those shows that you have with him very interesting because, you know, he, he said, that's what goons do is just try to see how much money you'll take. But, Real, real corruption is a lot more subtle. 
than that. You know, the FDA is not shy about taking a bribe, but they don't always take that bribe in the form of cash. Well, I think that the, the people think that politicians have their, they're wringing their hands in smoke filled rooms and let's make them do this and let's get, we'll do this and we'll sell that. And no, it's more, it's more um, subtle. And uh, it, it, Thomas Massey has a great Facebook show. I wish I knew what it was called. I'll, I'll see if I can dig it up and put it in the show notes. Where he's basically like talking to this, uh, he's doing a Facebook YouTube series where he's exposing how Congress actually works. And he talks about, you know, if I want a chairmanship, I have to, I have to pay for it. Uh, he's, he's in a fairly safe seat in Kentucky, but that doesn't matter. He has to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars a month or, or millions of years to, to, to stay in Congress and he has to raise it for the caucus for these 75 swing states. So this is what legislatures always do. They gerrymandered the districts across the, you know, here in Indiana, for instance, there's only a half a dozen state House and Senate seats that are actually competitive. And they draw the maps that way so the parties can conserve resources. Because if they had to be competitive in 435 House districts across the nation, it'd be too much for the parties, right? So the parties draw maps in, in certain ways. Um, and, and so what you have all these safe congressmen who still have these requirements. If you want to get a bill passed, if you want to get your name on a bill, if you want to get a chairmanship, if you want to do anything of, of significance, because Joe Donnelly is one of these guys who lost here in Indiana as a Democrat and it, the, all the commercials, it was nothing but he's the least effective senator in Senate history. You know, and like for a Republican to say, I'm going to go be more effective in Washington than my opponent is like, oh, okay, you're just going to spend more money than him. Like, so it was a weird argument to begin with, but they don't, they don't want that. So Massey talks about how, you know, because he didn't raise a certain amount of money, he wrote a bill with another congressman and they took his name off of it and put somebody else's name on it, even though his staff had actually passed the legislation. And so then you go back to your district when it's time to run for reelection empty handed. And uh, so one of the ways he's chosen to combat this is to put the word out and do these, uh, do these type of interviews and tell people what's happening. And so who do you raise the money for? It's not just small donors. It's big donors from your district. It's corporations. Uh, and so it's sort of a, a survival thing. And so if you're Thomas Massey, if you're J Justin Amash, and if you're a libertarian congressman, you want to go to Washington and be effective and repeal things and roll things back and do things differently. Uh, you know, you have to do certain things because in the long run that you look at it and you go, okay, well, I have to compromise in these certain ways because the greater good can be achieved in these ways. You know, and this is when the pork system was in place. Ron Paul always got dinged because Ron Paul was a huge porker. He was always building things in his district and he knew it's because I've got to bring things back to the district this allocated money back to my district because I'm not going to get a lot of bills passed because I'm going to say no on a lot of bills. And so I've got to show something for my time in Washington, D.C., but it's completely worth it because I'm going to be able to pass the audit the Fed bill or I'm going to do the, these greater goods. And so this is the problem for many people who are libertarians who want to get involved in politics. If you're involved in politics, the system is inherently unlibertarian. Yes. You're going to have to make compromises and you have to just go, okay, well, I'm going to compromise here, here, and here. Uh, and so that's the tough part about being a libertarian is you have to make compromises at certain places. And that's what this article, to circle back to the article, he's saying they're just going to end up corrupt like the other parties. So what's the point? Well, the point is, is that you get elected congressmen. <laughs> you get to start rolling back regulations and you get to pass certain bills and yeah, you may do a few things that aren't necessarily pure, but at least you're a libertarian. And, and so for some people, that's the choice that you have to make if you're going to be involved in politics. Are you going to be impure and are you going to virtue signal to your friends that you're an anarcho-capitalist that doesn't vote because you're pure? Or are you going to get in there and fight and actually reduce the size of government? Because we're not having an armed revolution anytime soon, nor should we. We should fight through the system the way that the system is designed and we should inspire people to want to vote a different way through persuasion and not force. So, um, so it, it, it tied into this argument is the purity argument. And that's just the inherent problem. If you're going to run for office and you get elected to that office, 
what what impure things are you going to do or you're going to have to vote on or vote against or take part in that you're just morally opposed to even down to saying the pledge before the city council meeting Cody. well and you should really put your money where your mouth is you know walk the talk and i have a huge amount of respect for libertarian philosophy. I am pretty pure as far as a libertarian goes. Of course, I'm going to say that and people will pick me apart because I vote, but I am pretty, you know, I, I'm pretty down with understanding most of the philosophies and understanding a libertarian first mindset. However, you give, you give me the John Galt option. Give me the we got out of America choice. You know, at least do that. I noticed that you have a problem voting. Do you have a problem paying your taxes as well? Well, you say you do, but you don't avoid it. I don't see many of you. I don't see us in mass going to jail for not paying our taxes, which they will absolutely do if you don't do, you know, and isn't what our taxes do a lot worse than whatever your vote does, whatever hypothetical voting you have for legitimizing the system. Fine. You legitimize the system with your vote. But you pay your taxes, and that goes to murder people overseas. We know that. We say that as libertarians, but we still do it. And the reason we do it is because we don't want to get kicked out of this country. We would rather fix it than just trying to overthrow the whole thing. Look, I'll be the first person. If you buy an island and say it's libertarian only, we're starting our new country, I'll show up. I'll be your research guru, whatever, policy analyst, I whatever, for that island. I'll show up. I'll move. I'll work. I'll, I'll work two jobs. I'll be excited for it. But until you give me that option, you're working within this system. Yeah, and I think that's sort of the point that I wanted to raise about this article because I think everybody, you brought up taxes, for instance. I'm certain that there are a lot of anarchists who are paying their taxes and filing their taxes. And the reason is because they've made the calculated choice that being free in society and paying 30% still gives me the freedom to go out there and run campaigns or run podcast networks or um, run, you know, a business that does 3D printing printed guns, you know, and so we, we all make these little choices of, okay, what's the cost benefit here? So it's going to cost me X if I do this, but the benefit if I do it here is this, you know, and so to me, it is, it is, um, yes, you just have to live with that cognitive dissonance that running for office may make you an impure libertarian and you're going to take guff from libertarians. But at the end of the day, through the process of running for office, going to, if you're, if you're Larry Sharp, yes, you put a lot of time, effort, money into this race. If you had gotten elected governor of New York, you'd probably have to sign a bunch of stuff that probably would be pretty impure. Um, but at the end of the day, through the process of running for office, Larry Sharp created a bunch of new baby libertarians in his area. And so by asking people to vote and, and say, I want you to use the violence of your vote and use the, and direct the force of government towards libertarians. Yeah. Well, he, he was impure for asking people to vote for him, but at the end of the day, what's the, the benefit was better. You know, he, he, at the end of the day created a lot of new libertarians. So I do think that there is, um, Internet libertarians love to be consistent and pure in their ideology, but that's not the world. The world is messy. And so if there are ways that you can encourage libertarianism of whatever strand you believe in, um, you know, there are some, there's just some fun, like there are some things that are non-negotiable. Like if you're a libertarian candidate that believes in gun control, then you're not a libertarian. Like you just don't understand libertarianism. Like that's, it's it's just a, an inherent thing. Uh, you might want to work that out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that uh, people who don't believe in the ideology X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. I'm saying that um, understand what you believe, understand the principles that you believe in, and then act those out in whatever ways that you feel you can best act those out in. Uh, I've worked in radio forever, and I felt a podcast network would be a really good way to, to get my message out there. I got this great organizing experience from working at the Libertarian Party. So I'm able to recruit and manage and lead people like Hody and, you know, hey, come on into the circle. Use your talents for this and, and create new Libertarians. Like, that's how I choose to, to use my particular set of skills uh, for the Libertarian cause. And, um, you know, I think you need to do the same. And if that's, uh, just don't get bummed out. Like, I have one friend She's constantly being henpecked by li internet libertarians for voting or for volunteering for campaigns. And she's an anarchist and she's just like, I'm just so miserable. Like, I hate this. Like, I feel so guilty. It's like, 
because you're trying to fit into a group of people who are just not nice. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of henpecking you. Sure. We're individuals, you know, and we're very well-versed individuals. Libertarians are very passionate. Uh, they did a study uh, of uh, analyzing like what percentage of political content is online and libertarians have like an even share as like Democrats and Republicans, because we, even though we only re represent a small portion of the population, we're, we're talkers, we're studiers, we're debaters. And there's a reason for that. You know, there's some great freedom minded philosophy there. And I'm fine with the philosophy. I really like 71 Republic. So I'm bummed out that my first episode on the big show, I get to talk about maybe a misstep here. I, I guess the only concern that I have is I would want to know what our, what my alternative is. Like, okay, if, if participating in this society is going to lead to bureaucratic nonsense, where is it then? Where do I go? Where do I go? For me, I'm doing what I think is the most likely option, which is trying to transform this country, you know, either when it goes to, to heck, you know, I'm going to show my Mormon self there, uh, <laughs> or when, or, or before then. And I'm hoping to convince most Americans before we're on the brink of civil war, before the government breaks down, before the Fed can't pay Social Security anymore. The thing is, we're heading towards that place. I hope we get there beforehand. I know that we'll get there when that happens, but I'm hoping to do so beforehand. So, I mean, unless they're, their suggestion is just to wait around. Now, they didn't say that. I'm sure that they're well, very well-versed people there at 71 Public as well. We've had them on the Brian Nichol Nichols show before. That they would have something to say about it, about what their changes would be. And I'd like to extend that the opportunity. But I wish they would have done that in this article as opposed to just, be, you know, dumping on libertarians. Right. So let's let's uh, go to the other guys, um, and there's some lessons for libertarians in this uh, breakdown as well. Uh, and so, what I want to do, Hody, is kind of give the top line view. Yeah. Let's give let's give the view of what happened in the Senate, House, and the governors' races, uh, and then let's kind of get a little bit granular with some of it. So, uh, let's start with the Senate because that's probably the more uh, granular. So, what what I'm bringing to the table. Uh, I'll go first because this is my show. Uh, is, uh, the, Not for long. <laughs> the, oh, God. Yeah. Oh, I got my mic. It's over. Uh, hey, Harry's sick, by the way. I, I didn't mention this, but Harry didn't quit. Harry has a baby now, and so he's like, I have realized he's been sick for like three weeks. And I go, what is the deal, man? And he goes, I have a baby now. They get sick and want cuddles, and then they just give their germs to me. It's like, ugh. So that, that's where Harry's at. Uh, he's not quitting yet. Uh, I haven't driven him away like some other co-host. Um, so when you look at the Senate race, uh, I'm looking over at Cook Political Report, which is kind of the, 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 the people that, that specialize, they feed, they're, they're like the Associated Press of a less electoral analysis. Um, so it, it, it looked really good in some ways for Republicans. And let's just do the generic here uh, of all the, all the themes around this midterm and the fallout. It seemed really good, like uh, maybe it was kind of a draw uh, at the end of Tuesday night. But now that we're a week out, they've lost the Arizona Senate race. Uh, there's recounts in the Florida Senate and governor's race. There, there probably will not be a recount in the Georgia governor's race. That nut job, uh, Brian Kemp, it looks like he's going to win. Um, you could but, say nut job and mention either one of those candidates, and you'd be correct. That's exactly right, yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're exactly right. But, you know, the, the Democrats are going to end up with around 35 seats. Uh, I think, what, they have like a 12, 15 vote advantage over the Republicans? Like, what were the – do you do you have the final numbers? Sure do. Okay. So, the as far as – Okay, so I know you said we we're going to start with the Senate. We're looking at it all. The House is actually going to be there were there were seven unfilled seats, and so if you're measuring it by like seats that the Democrats like picked up, you're looking at uh, 31 seats, but they actually picked up 38 seats if okay. you count the unfilled seats, and so they picked those up. So this blue wave was actually a little bit more significant than people gave it credit for. One of the reasons that it seemed stifled early on. When, you're, when most of us were actually awake and you're like, oh, is there no blue wave? Is because we got to see the East Coast results, specifically Florida, where they were looking to cash in the most and they did not do so. Right. Um, 
Florida was a very there there <laughs> there actually was two races or two uh, state um, parties that made an interesting decision to not invest until the last month. Um, the Republican Party in Arizona and the Democrat Party in Florida. And in neither case did it pay off. So that's something that maybe they want to learn going forward to say, we spent the majority of our money in the last very last month and hope for that, like, hey, you're about to vote. By the way, this guy, it did not right. work. A lot of people had their minds made up by that point. And the Democrats really paid for it in Florida. Like the rest of the country did have a, a, a legitimate blue wave, uh, at least in the House, by picking up 38 new seats, 31 seats that the Republicans lost. Um, and so that was a, a moderate blue wave. Was it what they were hoping for? No, it's not what could have been. Um, I'll talk about the Kavanaugh thing later because uh, we're coming up on that. Yeah, well, that we'll absolutely get... stifled the wave. Um, yeah, so that that and we'll see that in the exit polling that that really hurt. But Amy Walter made a good point in uh, the Cook Political Report in a post called "Why Aren't Democrats More Excited About the 2018 Results?" Um, you know, they they had a really solid year, and uh, it just didn't seem that way. And she had one paragraph in here. Take the Midwestern battleground states that Trump easily carried back in 2016. This year, Democratic gubernatorial candidates like Fred Hubble in Iowa and Richard Cordray in Ohio didn't get the same fawning national media attention that Gillum, Abrams, or Beto got. They weren't going to make history. They didn't make viral Instagram videos. They didn't get Oprah or DJ Khalid to campaign with them. Even so, their losses were another reminder of the difficult path Democrats have in winning Midwestern states that were once considered toss-up territory. And I think that, um, you know, and let me finish th with this. Again, for the record, reading too much into a midterm election outcome is dangerous and often very wrong. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do it anyways, Amy. But <laughs> we also know that the 2020 race for the Democratic nomination has started. And I know that from my conversations with Democratic activists, many are uninspired, are not inspired by the cast of potential candidates in front of them now. The 2018 election was supposed to anoint a clear front runner. It didn't. It may have put a renewed focus on Midwestern-based figures like Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota or Sherrod Brown of Ohio. What 2018 did do, which is why Republicans aren't disheartened by Tuesday's results and Democrats are less than ebullient about them, was show just how similar the Electoral College map looks to the one in 2016. And so Democrats got a little ahead of themselves, and it's easy to do when you have natural cheerleaders in the mainstream media, and this is a point that Ben Shapiro has made uh, on his show this week, is that it's a little bit easier for Republicans to convince voters to vote for them because they actually have to make counter arguments 365 days a year, seven days a week, whereas Democrats don't have to go on Sunday shows and defend Donald Trump and defend, you know, like, f for instance, no, no Democrat had to go on and defend the comments of violent rhetoric by Maxine Waters or Eric Holder, but many Republicans for weeks had to go on and defend Donald Trump or make a defense of Donald Trump uh, when he said, you know, just uh, punch him, just I'll pay for your lawyer. And, and so that's sort of what he's talking about is when you don't have to, when you don't have that check, then you don't have that, when you don't have that challenge, that intellectual challenge, then you're not going to be as strong. And so there was runaway enthusiasm within the media and the base and within just kind of like your, your politogram people, the people who are political on Instagram to show that they're fashionable like everybody else. Yeah, of course, they're really into Gillum and Abrams and they want this intersectional win and Beto is a rock star and people got a little too ahead of themselves. And then they, it's like libertarians and, and Larry Sharp. It's like, no, we, it's... <laughs> It's like uh, who is uh, the Minnesota Vikings coach? They are who we thought they were. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, that was the Cardinals at the time. He okay. was the Vikings coach. Uh, uh, you know what I'm talking. Uh, yeah, they are who we the Bears are who we thought they were. <laughs> right? They are who we thought they were. I'm That's sure Dennis the, Green. Dennis Green. Dennis I had to look yes. uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. So the media was just like, uh, you know, uh, Democrats are going. They are who we thought they were. And uh, they didn't choose our super progressive candidates. And the only intersectional super progressive wins we got were in predictable races. And mm -hmm. 
episode. Oh, man, now we have to run an uninspiring, boring candidate in 2020 if we want to beat Trump, which was kind of what we all knew because we're not Democrats. We're like, if you want to win, you need to run, run Biden. You know, <laughs> like you need to run a blue collar Democrat instead of an Ocasio-Cortez Democrat. You know, you, like the party right now is uh, online is really excited. The online Democrats, akin to the online libertarians, are really excited about the progressive candidates. Yeah. You know, they're excited about the, the more extreme candidates. But like, no, nah, you, you know, don't Larry Sharp this. Don't get your uh, uh, you're, you're too new to politics to realize that you're not going to win in Ohio for the governor's race. <laughs> you know, you're not even going to win in Georgia for the governor's race. Um, you know, there's too much enthusiasm leading into this. And this was kind of like every libertarian when they're new gets punched in the face with that 3% for the first time. Yep. And so libertarians had that this time. Democrats, I think, had this, this time. And the, and the Trump newbies on the Republican side still think he's my mythical. And uh, 2020 is probably going to be your wake-up call. Um, so I, I think that's kind of why Democrats are not really excited about a near wave. I'm not going to term it a wave election. I don't. They didn't get the 40 or 50. I don't. I think they. I think it was underwhelming. I think their performance was underwhelming. Yeah. Um, but they had some really, as a party, good fundamentals leading to their future, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. So yeah. continue on with some of the numbers, Hody, or give your give your response to what I said. Uh, I shouldn't interrupt. Uh, no. I should like you said, it's your show. I mean, I, I'm hoping to replace Harry, but uh, oh, I said that out loud. Uh, you know, the the one one of the things that I noticed was how, and, and we're going to get to this in a minute as well. But the polling also showed that anytime the Democrat was ahead by only like less than five percent, they probably lost. The polling right. is not correct anymore. I think there's a we kind of know the fraction of Republicans that are scared to admit they're voting for Republicans and they're not showing up on these polls. And so I think that the reason they were like, we're looking at like a 50 point wave is they said, if all the pieces fall how they are right now, you know, we'll split the Senate at 50 50. They actually lost two seats at the Senate. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll take, you know, we'll take over half of the governor's races. They didn't get quite there. They took 24. Uh, of tw of the 50 states so we got 24 democrats now and they you know and, and then the house was a moderate gain everybody knew they were going to take the house they didn't know they were just going to barely take the house they thought they were really going to smack it down and the, so the polling didn't help either uh it was all i wanted to add by saying that the polling you know if you just said oh chips fall that where they may the democrats are going to crush it well the trip chips didn't fall that way you had closeted republicans that really showed up um it it uh, to go back a bit. The Republicans in Arizona that aired uh, that that again saved their money for the last two weeks that aired a campaign there uh, didn't pay off for them either. And so the Republicans had some very big big missteps as well. Lost a few places where they thought they were going to be able to maintain. Um, and so it was uh, maybe saying a blue wave isn't isn't right. You're right. There really didn't wave one way or the other. This was kind of very in line with what happens in a in a midterm election uh, with a Republican in office in, in the presidential office. Um, there's still a little bit to wonder on if how much economy played into this. A lot of the places that flipped uh, red had some of the better employment rates and a lot of ones that flip blue had some of the worst ones. So kind of seeing how the Trump economy and tariffs are impacting people still mattered. It's nice to know that there's some type of polling that at least we can count on that people still do based on their uh, pocketbooks books. Excuse me. I muted myself. This was the first election in a long time where the economy was not the number one issue. Yeah. Um, which we, when we get to the exit polling, we'll see what was the number one issue. But the economy was number three. And I think I said it on our election night, and I think I said it in the preview. I just don't think people feel that the economy's good yet. Uh, and we'll see if they, they still do in two years when everybody's up again. But I just don't think it, like the, the economy is beginning to get good, but I don't think people actually feel that it's good yet. It's hard to measure simply by unemployment rates and median income, which are both 
in a good spot right now for most states. You know, no state was higher than 6.5% unemployment. No state was lower than 2.2%. So we're all kind of dealing with roughly the same unemployment rate. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that feeling because that is where most people are kind of at, especially if you've maintained employment this whole time. Look, let's be honest here. That's only like a 4% difference. Yes, that's big from two years ago when we were looking at, you know, almost double digits on unemployment. So we're looking at like down 4%, but unless you're one of those four in a hundred that was looking for work and couldn't find it, eh, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, most of those medium in incomes, that was also good news that of course the Republicans happened to find out the day before election night that median, median uh, incomes were on the rise. That's probably a majority of unemployment ending. So again, that same 4% that found work in these last two years that couldn't find it before. Well, I remember, I remember some conservatives saying during the tax cut, like, hey, guys, why would you give tax cuts to the rich? Because those are not the people that are going to vote for you. Like, you want to talk about corruption. But I think Ben Shapiro actually made that argument. He's like, this isn't going to help you in elections at all because you're just giving it to people who are wealthy. And those people already vote Republican. And so if you really want middle, that's why Bush, you know, gave everybody like a rebate of, you know, $250 or something. Uh, you know, my coworker, she's 26. She's like, I got three extra dollars a paycheck and ain't enough to swing my vote, you know? So it, it's, it, it, I don't think that those tax cuts necessarily were felt by regular people. It may have been felt by their employers. And that's why, you know, people, we're still in the cycle where people are investing all that money. But it, it, but it didn't translate to any votes for them, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, patently obvious by the fact that they lost more elections than they won this time for the yeah. Republicans. And so there is some consideration to have there by saying, wow, the economy is, by every metric that we've been using, a lot better than where it's been over the past 20 years. And yet, eh. It's our third most important issue. Now, of course, you know, of course, I'm sure Republicans lament that now that it's actually better, people stop caring about it. But uh, right. them's the break. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so let's let's move a step down mm -hmm. and get one step down granular on, on our three part uh, journey here. Um, let's let's go into the Senate. Uh, the Senate. Uh, so again, from Cook Political Report, Geography is Destiny. Um, there are three calls, three races that are not called as of now. Um, when she wrote this, there were three. Arizona was called for uh, Kristen Cinema, And if anybody calls her Cinnamon Rolls, I want credit for that. I thought of that last night on Twitter. Um, <laughs> she's the first openly bisexual candidate to win a race. Um, I think the first openly gay man... Yeah. Was governor was it what was it Colorado? Colorado, Jared Polis. Oh, Jared Polis. Okay, and um, there were there are several intersectional victories. Uh, so meaning people of minority of et different ethnicities. Uh, I think there were two Muslim women elected for the first time. The first refugee, the first two female American Native Americans, mm -hmm. um. And then uh, Ocasio Cortez, <laughs> she's. I follow her on Instagram, and I have to be honest, I do like following her on Instagram because she's showing her followers every part of the process. And so she is uh, sometimes annoyingly progressive, but it is kind of interesting to see like the freshman's journey through this whole process. So, uh, so I think I have to. I do also also want to warn libertarians. Uh, a former co-host said, there is no virtue, there is no profit in, in bashing Trump all the time. It doesn't help libertarians. It doesn't help the program. Bashing Ocasio-Cortez, I think, doesn't necessarily help libertarians either. I think it goes back to, uh, it doesn't help you if you punch the other side. It just inflames them. Tell people what you're about instead. Um, but, uh, so several intersectional victories um, for people of color. Uh, yeah. so well, let's not finish with Ocasio-Cortez. She's fantastic for libertarians. It helps to have somebody who, when they are not on a prompter, say the most ridiculous things that you want socialists to say, but normally they're too smart to say it. 
Oh, oh, you mean like, oh, Amazon is moving to my district in New York City and I'm mad about it because they're an evil company and I don't want them to bring all of these jobs because I want to maintain rent control and I hate gentrification. (laughs) And and that's just today. That's just today. She's fantastic. And so like you need somebody like this in the spotlight to be like, I mean, yeah, this is a straw man to say like, is this what you believe? Is this what you believe? Is this what you like? I mean, she is, she is so... I think she doesn't become unhinged in the sense that she like lets her hair down and like loses her mind, but she'll just casually be like, yeah, well, that's why we should take over all the oil companies or something. And you'll just be like, wait, wait, what? What? You You want to nationalize the banks? What? Yeah. You just said the thing that you're not supposed to say, you know, uh, I was, she was with Bernie Sanders and said, we can't wait to turn the seed red, like, uh, like communist red. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and that was that was live, and so she's just one of those that you know people remember how bad Obama was when his uh, teleprompter broke. Ocasio Cortez is that times a million. Just no, no, no. Any- she is she is Sarah Palin of the resistance. You have yes. Sarah, Sarah Palin of the Tea Party, and she's just the the mirror image of that on the left. I mean, I've, the parallels having been one of the founding members of the state Tea Party, you know, the bowels of Buca de Beppo. 20 of us getting together forming the Indiana Freedom Coalition uh, or whatever we called it. Like I was there for the beginning of the Tea Party and I remember the evolution of it and the resistance has all the same hallmarks. And you know what the interesting thing is, is the Tea Party technically has their president installed. They technically, um, you know, Kevin McCarthy will likely be the Speaker of the House, but Jim Jordan really could have given him a run for his money. The senators that all got elected, are much more aligned with Tea Party uh, people than they are the traditional establishment Republicans, which just took a bath in the suburbs. Um, you know, so it is like, all right, well, the Tea Party's kind of installed in as much as they're going to get installed. And uh, it's just a more extreme version of social conservatism, Bush's social conservatism. Like, I'm not really looking forward to the... Um, the socialist revolution coming to the house of representatives, but you always have to keep in mind history, Hody. Like we went through this in the progressive era as a country. We went through this in the thirties. We went through this in the sixties. Like these people, we have these more radical groups come in and out of the Congress on both sides. And eventually America, this is kind of like an, an election where the adults stood up and said, okay, all right, I've had enough. And they put in a bunch of moderate Democrats that, aren't going to go after gun control and who are, you know, fairly conservative. They're, a lot of them are veterans. Like the, the Democrats really did a great job of understanding that if they want to take back the house, they need to not find lunatics. They need to find Democrats that are more moderate and they, and they ran them in these suburban districts and they, and they won big. And uh, you know, and that, that may be uh, the, the Democrats kind of lurching back to more moderation, but uh, you look th- at Manchin, who won West Virginia. He was the only swing vote for and sustaining Kavanaugh. Who just yeah. said, you know, I might not like the guy, but ultimately, is he qualified to be a judge? Yes, he is. And I mean, Dem- he got reelected, and it ended up not even being one of the closer races in West Virginia for a Democrat. Right. I mean, you want to look at the moderates. I think it was funny. One of the things they talk about going into the night were like, oh, if Abrams and Gillen clean up, this is going to be a sign to go totally radical. And they got the exact opposite message. Right. All their moderates won. You know, <laughs> I think it, it, is, it is just another election that kind of like the polling was kind of accurate, but like the media still is totally out of touch with regular America. They just like CNN couldn't be further from your average American. And the coasts just couldn't be further from it. So continuing on, um, I believe, Hody, I predicted 35 in the House and 53 in the Senate. I have you written down right here. All right. Yeah. 52. You said 52 finish in the House and a plus 35 in the Senate, which is pretty darn good. All right. So uh, so say, say, say what I had again. Uh, 30, uh, 52 Republicans in the House or in the – I'm sorry, in the Senate. And it ended up being 54, but everybody thought that number was going to be low except for Brian Nichols. Who I, I still think it's going to be 50, uh, 53. I, I don't think they're going to get – I think Florida's going to go their way. Arizona and uh, Mississippi and Florida will go the Republican way. And then Arizona, obviously, is the Democratic uh, yeah. breakdown. So That's how I have the chips fall too. So yeah. I believe it's going to be 54 after all that. But uh, – 
Yeah, you had 52. I think Brian Nichols picked, actually predicted plus two GOP in the Senate. So hats off to you, Brian, wherever you are. Uh, he won that one. But you had plus 35 in the House, which was about spot on, depending on how you wanted to look at it. They gained between 31 is what you'd measure from taking it from Republicans, but 38 overall seats. Okay. Uh, Joe Donnelly uh, in Indiana, Claire McCaskill and Heidi Heitkamp in um, – in uh, North Dakota were picked up by the Republic. They all, they all lost Democrats lost to Republicans. Uh, Democrats picked up the seat in Nevada. Uh, Jackie Rosen won. You know, it's interesting in the way that they write this, they say that here's the Democrats that lost. And then here's the Democrats that won. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Republicans gain Republican gains are outside the edge of their predictions. Um, so a 54, 453 seat majority I don't think it's going to be that comfortable and I don't think people are really kind of taking this into account uh, you know you're going to have Mitt Romney in there who is not Orrin Hatch was a reliable senator Mitt Romney's not going to be a reliable senator and so you know Trump is like alright yes we've got the Senate that'll be my bulwark but you're you know you're you're losing the flake seat to a Democrat you're losing um you know, Mike Braun's going to be rather a rubber stamp, but you're going to have Mitt Romney, who's a little flip floppy. Susan Collins is up in 2020. Uh, Corey Gardner in Colorado is up in 2020. Mm-hmm. And that is an increasingly liberal state. Yep. Uh, Susan Collins obviously is an increasingly liberal state. So there's three votes. So we're down to 50 for Republicans if they want to pass stuff. So, you know, then you add in Murkowski and uh, some of these others. So, it's not going to be as reliable as I think Republicans. Republicans are all excited about the Senate, but I think you're going to see a lot of flip-flopping going on over there. Um, so we'll find out in, in, in these recounts. Um, where is my recount information? Okay, from National Review, Jim Garrity, their uh, elections reporter, wrote in the morning jolt today, one week later, the midterms don't look so good for the GOP. Uh, talks about the this this guy in uh, Bay County just let people email and fax votes in 147 votes mostly Republican votes but they're like no nah, you can't just do that can't just decide about the law even if it's the best of intentions <coughs> um <coughs> excuse me uh, National Review basically says you know the excite the vote vote strategy was insufficient at best and a failure at worst. Um, let's see, um, darn it. Where's the stat where basically none of these, oh, okay. Uh, according to an analysis by the nonpartisan group fair go fair vote, which advocates for electoral reforms that make it easier to vote out of 4,687 statewide elections between 2000 and 2016, just 26 went to a recount. Of those 26, just three recounts wound up changing the initial result of the race, 2004 Washington governor's race, the 2006 Vermont state auditor's race, and the Minnesota U.S. Senate race in 2008. Um, The average swing in those three elections after recounts, 311 votes. So most most of these recounts never end up actually changing the result unless it's super close. Uh, in the Minnesota Senate race, Norm Coleman basically got screwed after one county clerk found a box of votes in his trunk, and they were Democratic votes. It was crazy. Uh, so don't expect those Florida results necessarily to change. Same in Georgia if there were to be a recount. Um, so, yeah. So I haven't counted on recounts for forever. I, I think that's just implicit knowledge if you followed the last two or three elections. you if you've stayed awake hoping for a change in the president, you went to bed very, very late and very tired and very unchanged. Yeah. Right. So uh, in the in the Senate race, so let's go to the House. Um, five takeaways from the Democrats' House triumph. This was mostly a suburban revolt. And Hody, this is something that we have seen a lot as some of the races that we tracked. You know, any any Clinton district, any Republican held district that Clinton won flipped. Uh, and in these seats, ads declaring the incumbent voted with Trump 90 for 95 percent of the time proved too much to overcome uh, in outer middle class suburbs that Trump carried by single digits. 
they also broke through and won those races. Um, Democrats didn't win, win a single Republican seat where Trump cracked 55% of the vote in 2016. Uh, and they fell short in several of those. Uh, number two, this was the year of the fired up female college graduate. More than 100 women elected to the House, almost entirely driven by Democrats. Um, of the 38 seats Democrats flipped or maintained a lead, women were the Democratic nominees in 21. And I would say to libertarians, hey, uh, they elected 100 women to the House because 100 women w ran for office. So libertarians run for office regardless of party. Um, so as a result, I don't think Nancy Pelosi is going anywhere. Nancy Pelosi will be the speaker, which the Republicans will love because she has horrible, unfavorable ratings. But you can't be the year of the woman and then throw the first female speaker of the house out. So she's also a very, very uh, shrewd politician, but it is interesting to see the San Francisco liberal Nancy Pelosi become the center of the democratic caucus uh, because it's moved so far left. Um, the Republicans that did survive in tough seats took a moderate, had moderate reputations and, and opposed Trump in certain ways. Think flake, Jeff flake. Uh, and Democrats hard pickup count is already at 31, but it looks good. And uh, we've covered that. So there's, they're adding totals now. So those are some of the broader uh, things that stood out in the house. What about you, Hody? What did, what stood out to you in the house races? You know, something the same, I guess a message for both, both the Republicans and Democrats. I think the bad news for some of the Democrats is that none of your extremists succeeded in the house. However, you should absolutely take away the good news that they won a lot of rural areas that have traditionally been Republican, that were plus Romney, that were plus Trump, um, and, and won a bunch of them in states that you wouldn't ordinarily think about. And so, you know how when Republicans, they love to sh throw in your face the map where it's all red and little blue spot spots. Right. They're like, here's us and here's you. This is actually the, the, the worst that map has like ever looked. And it's not the biggest lead that the House has ever had. It's just that they picked up some of these districts in places that you wouldn't think about. A lot of the places that were hit hard by the Trump tariffs and the steel, um, the steel tariff actually went blue for their local representative. Now, these steel areas have been, you know, what you would think is red territory for a really long time. And so I think that that's a good news, bad news for the Democrats. One is you can't go total communist insane unless you're in New York. And the good news is that you can absolutely, if you decide to be a moderate and you're patient and you meet people and, you know, you, you say, you know what, maybe we're not going to be able to take your guns, but, you know, let let let's at least get some uh, minimum wage laws going again not good news for libertarians but as far as democrat democrats go you know increase of medicare was another wildly popular thing uh you know you run on those moderate things and you can have some success as a democrat even in rural areas yeah. as far as yeah for the republicans um obviously tough news overall especially when we're looking in the house um, but again, with good news, bad news time, I think that the best news for the Republicans is that I, I see some hope for a party after Trump. And I think that that was a huge worry of mine two years ago for the Republicans. I shouldn't say worry. I hope all the Republican and, and Democrats fall apart and we would be all become libertarian. But, you know, for, if I were thinking like this, Listen, I'm going to tell you, I, let's just all be honest. Even as libertarians, you see it every election cycle. We all pretend that we're all unbiased, but I don't know a single libertarian, if they're honest, that doesn't favor one of the two parties. You may not vote for them, but you're kind of like, yeah, I'd kind of prefer to have a Republican house because they're not going to pass meta. They're not going to pass Obamacare. Like I, I was fully like, you know, I really don't want the Democrat. I don't want the Democrats to win this because I don't want Obamacare when it was 2010 time. You know, I mean, yeah, right. So I just think libertarians just be honest. Like you, you don't have to throw that in there and say, unless or not, you know, I am down with the cause, but so that's just my, you can do whatever you want, Hody, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> I just think everybody kind of favors one or the other parties and it's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't make you less of a libertarian. It's just kind of like, it's like if you're from Indiana and you move to California, you're still always like, oh, I miss Indiana. I'll never move back to Indiana, but I miss it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know what? I don't even want to leave that subject. T talk about that for just a second. 
you know, you had the Republican, you had the Liberty Caucus, which is mostly Republicans. I think one of the reasons that my um, bias has seemed to have accidentally shown itself as far as the other two parties go, is that a lot of the 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 Democrats that used to caucus with Liberty, the Liberty Caucus, and um, used to talk and, and give speeches, Jared Paulus has gone full-blown, you know, leftist. He doesn't, you know, he, he banned me for even asking about how he would he talked about balancing state budgets and I was like, do you still believe in that after embracing the ACA and, you know, got blocked. I'm sure it was one of his staffers, but again, that's not the direction that he wants to go. Cory Booker is somebody who's actually called himself a libertarian before and he hasn't gone in that direction. Booker now, was somebody that like, I remember saying several, like a couple of years ago, like he's my favorite Democrat. Yeah. And uh, because he really seemed reasonable, he was working with Rand on policies. Like I remember watching him in the street fight, a documentary called street fight. Yeah. Uh, when he ran for mayor of Newark at, at the beginning, like he's somebody that I really was. And now I'm just like, oh, I don't like Cory Booker. Like if Cory Booker from three years ago, the real Cory Booker were running for president, I think it'd be different. But the Cory Booker that's trying to run for president, I think scares people to death. And that's why he mobilized so many people during the Kavanaugh thing to, to like, I can't vote for Donnelly. I got to get this guy out. And, and it scares people like me to know that somebody is, I want to believe that, you know, the Masseys and the Pauls are honest in their libertarianism. They might not be great on immigration. They might not be great on, you know, whatever the libertarian policy is, uh, uh, abortion. But at least I can support their liberty-minded focus. Whereas I think a lot of, at least me, I feel left in the dust by those same people that used to be there with the Pauls and the Masseys. And that was the Bookers and the Pauluses that now don't even want to pretend that they've ever associated with the Liberty Caucus before. And right. that, I don't like that. I, that, that, that. I don't like that. And so I'm absolutely open to the Democrats that do keep that Liberty focus, but almost all of them. Is there any in the Liberty Caucus anymore? I'm not even sure. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't follow it as, as a grain. I mean, I've, I'm, we're going deep down here just because I've, I've researched it. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's jump into some of this exit polling because I sent it to you in the chat for the Zoom chat here uh, if you want to see what jumps out at you. And I'm on the National House. So this is the CNN exit poll. And exit polling is the most accurate polling. And you've seen some people try to float this theory that it's not, but it's, it's thousands of people. This is based on 18, 19,000 people and it's in person and it's, you walk out of your polling place and a person with a clipboard stands there and says, hi, you know, here in Indiana, it's the only way to get any kind of accurate snapshot of the electorate because we don't allow robocalling. So a robocall will call, are you willing to take a call from Gravitas polling? Uh, sure. And then please hold, and then they connect you to somebody that will take the poll. You're not allowed to do that here. And so you get polls with three, four, 500 people in Indiana. And so you can't really, like, all the, all the polls here in Indiana showed Donnelly winning. Um, and, yeah. and he didn't. I think the only one was, uh, what was the, was it Trafalgar? Was it Trafalgar? I think Trafalgar predicted him winning. Although. Or Rasmussen. I think it might have been Rasmussen, you know, and uh, uh, showed Braun winning. But, um, Exit polling is a very good snapshot of how people voted and why. And so we're not going to jump down. The only libertarian that got put into any of this was Indiana's Lucy, uh, Lucy Brenton. So we may jump to that after this if it's not incredibly boring. But, Hody, we're going to do our best to kind of look at these statistics. And I'm going to need your help to make sure that it is clear, uh, that I am clear, mm -hmm. as we kind of go through this stuff. Because I think this spells... Uh, it's good news for libertarians, disaster for Republicans, and uh, good news for Democrats, which means a disaster for uh, the disaster for reducing the size and scope of the central government. Um, not that Republicans are any better, but at least you know they're not on a bullet train. Uh, so, when you look at the national, how people voted out of nineteen thousand people, uh, and and the exit polling from CBS. And the exit polling from MDC and uh, several other exit polls that I read all kind of match the CNN exit polling. So don't let it scare you that it's from fake news CNN uh, because it's very accurate. It's almost identical to NBC and CBS, for instance. Uh, so uh, when it comes to gender, 
uh, the P- they surveyed 48% male, 52% female. So about half, 50-50. 60% of women, 59% of women voted Democrat, and 51% of males voted Republican. So the, the Republicans are, are winning the males, but barely, 51 to 47. But Democrats are just blo- beating Republicans' heads in. And this is sort of a trend that pollsters and pundits have said for years to Republicans, you have to fix your women problem. They're the, they're the majority in society now, and you're getting beaten you know, and that, you know, it goes back to binders full of women. That's what the question was about. How are you going to get more female engagement in government and the Republican Party? And he's like, I've got binders full of women. Binders uh, full of chicks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, Hody, they, the Democrats have a clear advantage when it comes to women. Well, they haven't, I mean, we're going to get into it. They have an advantage on almost everything. I mean, it, it, it's, it's anytime a Republican is like ahead in these exit polls, it's they either got like 50 or 51% when the Democrat wins among like, and this is again, when we talk about like the Democrats engaging in identity politics, this is their success, you know, because they target that group and they say, you are us. You just don't know it yet. You know, one of the tough problems you have to in- overcome as a libertarian is because you don't say you say we're for everybody equally the democrats will target you and say we're offering you voting benefits we're offering you financial benefits we're offering you free housing we're offering you free phones we're offering you this health care you know and so this is very much this is very promising that those promises are paying off for the democrats uh that that they're saying you know we we promise big things to these guys and right now they're buying it uh, fifty-nine percent to forty percent in the female. That's that's a lot of cold households, from what yeah. I'm seeing. Uh, as far as the Republican Democrat split on male female. Sorry, uh, I had the door open because it got so hot in here. Uh, now, now it's down to sixty-four in here. Harry Harry said he had his house at seventy-eight, so he would have been very miserable right now. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, so when you when you go to the age breakdowns, um, eighteen to forty four. Let's just do the general and we'll work our way down. Eighteen to forty four year olds, sixty one percent Democrat, fifty percent Republican. So it's 50, 50, 45 and older, yeah. and then everybody under forty four, it's sixty one percent, three percent no answer, and that's about the that's about the libertarian base is about three percent. Uh, you know, when you go to 18 to 29, 67% of them identify as Democrat, Republican, uh, 32%, 30 to 44, 58% to 39%. So 18 to 29 year olds, you know, Gen Z and, and millennials, uh, sort of the younger tier of millennials, almost 70% Democrats. They favor Democrats. They voted Democratic. <laughs> and then it's 50 50 in 45 to 64 and 65 and older yeah it, it's 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 big victories there uh in age I, I, and it's bit, here's an interesting topic do you think what makes you think that this polling is any different or this statistics any different than like 50 years ago where's the same thing Democrats cleaning up on the young kids and Republicans barely making it on the old people, but getting old, more old people to show up. I wouldn't even know how to tell. I wouldn't even know how to answer that, to be honest. Is it different uh, at all? Or is this the same? Are we just really, like, really about to dive into? Well, I think what you're oh, saying, I, I think up. what you're saying is like, okay, if you did this polling in 1968, wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, 18 to 44 year olds be 61% democratic, you know, the, right. the, the boomers at that point, And then the age into Republicans. And I, I don't think that there's, um, I don't think that it's necessarily a bad way to think about it. It, it could be true. Uh, when you look at Lucy Brenton here in Indiana, and so mm-hmm. obviously a more conservative state, but Lucy's, I don't know the Lucy's, I would call her, I, I don't know if she's conservative or not, but um, yeah, when you, Donald, Donald Trump offered her an olive branch on Twitter, and she burned that olive branch That's right. apart. I mean, she was um, like, no way. When you look at the, in that race, Lucy had 8% of the 18 to 44 crowd and 2% 45 and older. And uh, again, she's the only libertarian polled, so I'm not showing favoritism to my own, ha- own state. But when you really great, break it down into the generations, for instance, uh, 18 to 24, so Gen Z, 6% for Lucy Brenton. 
Millennials were nine and 10% at 25 to 29 and 30 to 39. So nine and 10%, 40 to 49, 3%, 50 to 64, 3%, 65 and older, 1%. So I have been saying forever, just don't waste your time talking to people who are over 40. We just need to get rid of boomers because if we did, we'd be at nine or 10% of the vote. And this, this shows that I'm right. My gut is right. 6% of Gen Z, and I just think that they don't know any better. They don't know there's a third option. Um, and then millennials are 10% libertarian and 10% voting for a libertarian. So you think about how many people are libertarian that just don't vote for the libertarian candidate. You know, the base in millennials and younger Gen Z is 10%. Cody, that's such, such good news for libertarians. You know, the, the young kids is where it's going to be at. Because here, here's bottom line, here's bottom line messaging. The right wing says, we need to make sure that your social security is sustainable. Old people say, okay, that sounds okay. Democrats are like, we need to give you even more of your social security. You know, old people say, oh yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. Libertarians are like, we need to get rid of social security. You're like, right. oh, okay. I don't know if I'm going to do that anymore. So you do have to strike while the iron's hot on the young kids. We don't want what happens to the Democrats as people age to happen as libertarians, to people as they age. So my hope is that the libertarian sticks with these millennial younger generations. I believe that it will, like the numbers that you say, we just have to make it stick more than it does with the Democrats. Because yeah. I think with the Democrats, those promises are empty. But, you know, and they find that out and then they become Republicans when they grow up. For libertarians, we don't promise anything. We promise the opposite of something. We promise less. And so I think it's hard for us to break our promises, especially because we're not in charge of anything. So hopefully we we're see- not promising you anything, but here's personal responsibility. Oh, that's a great message. Yeah. And you'll kind of see that once we get into the issues. Let's, move on, to, let's move on to race. So just, to, you know, race. Um, this, this was 72% white surveyed, 28% non-white. So it's a little heavy on white, but it's still kind of representative of where the population is. 76% uh, of non-whites support Democrats. 44% of whites support Democrats. Uh, when you look at the Republican numbers, 54% of whites are for Republicans. 22 are non-white Republicans. Uh, you know, so again, that's a very heavy number, 76%. When you break that down by race, then you get into whites are 44 Democrat, 54 Republican. So a small majority of 54%, like you said, black at 11% of those surveyed, um, they were 11% of the, the survey, 90% with Democrats, 9% with Republicans, uh, Latinos, 69% with Democrats, 29% with Republicans, Asians at 77% and 23. So, you know, friend was like, uh, she's a white woman. She's like, don't blame me for Beto losing in Texas. I'm like, I'm happy about that. So I'm, I'm cool. Uh, but uh, she's like, white women get blamed for everything now. And and 60% of Hispanics voted for, uh, like 40% of Hispanics voted for Ted Cruz. And I'm like, yeah, because Hispanics typically are a little more conservative. And this has always been my argument to Republicans. It's like, okay, you're, you're making the argument that, uh, well, we can't be like Europe. You have these different cultures coming in and disrupting things. It's like, okay, yeah, if you're like Lithuania, and you have this culture that's based around, I don't know, Lithuanians, and then you bring in a bunch of people who are from the Middle East who are completely different than yours. Yeah, I could see how that would be different. But this is America, and we have a history of being a melting pot, and you're talking about letting in people who are basically Westerners because they're Catholic, and they're pro-family, and they're anti-abortion. Like, what are you so mad about? These are your people. These are your voters. <laughs> like, uh, they're, they're anti-LGBT marriage. Like, it's, I've never understood why Republicans don't want Latinos in because, A, they're going to completely get destroyed as a party as Latinos and Gen Z and Gen Y millennials grow up because of their messaging, uh, which you can see 29% of Latinos favor Republicans versus 69%. But that, that is why, and A, you can't take, you have to take into consideration that a lot of Hispanics feel we came here the right way, or my parents or my great grandparents came here through these means. And I don't like that I am being targeted because of other people who didn't do the process the correct way. 
So that's why you see a lower, you see a more conservative Latino vote versus, you know, 90% black, 77% Asian, and then they're 69% Latino. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the racial numbers and the age numbers alone should just make Republicans crap their pants, Hody, because everybody who's, who is young and everybody who is non-white, a.k.a. the majority of people who will be voting in 20 years, absolutely dislike the Republican brand. Yeah, and let me give you... Uh, it it's bad on the exit polling. Now, if the exit polling was perfect, again, it's better than the than anything that happens beforehand. We would have seen, I think, an undoubted blue wave. So again, some of the Republicans, even if the after you ask them when they're leaving the polls, still don't feel great about admitting what they did. So we still have that going. Let me look at one specific thing, though. We have a country that is sixty one point three percent white. Okay. And then the exit polls, 72% of the white voters showed up. We have a disproportionate amount of white people that showed up and a non-proportional, you know, less than proportional percent of the non-white population that showed up. So one of the reasons that this was even close, you know, for the Republicans is because the whites showed up. Yeah, whites it's, over, it's oversampled by at 10 points, 11 points. And so... Yeah, those those numbers are not going to be crazy different, but it is it does factor in that the, it may actually be worse for Republicans when you look at these numbers. Yeah, um, and so so with them losing each of each of these categories, now the black at ninety percent is actually closer for Republicans than it's been prior to ninety percent is usually the minimum that the Democrats get for the black vote. Uh, the, the Latinos, like you said, that maybe there's some something that the Republicans can do there. This is not something long term they can just afford to avoid. Yeah. Ultimately, the young people are going to grow up. Unlike our generation, where we have the boomers that kind of messed up the whole system, they're not going. They're going to be. They're going to have people that are trying to fix that system, as opposed to people that created that system. So I don't think, unfortunately, for Republicans, you are not going to see that same democratic fall off as things get older yes the democrats over promise stuff that they're not going to deliver on but they're focusing on identity politics which is less about promising and more just saying we love you guys and they don't love you so much the Rebel republican party has a problem in that when the whites seem the most energized it's among a <laughs> it's when a very racially uh divisive president is in office Right. And so you have to be, I, I think my, if I was a Republican, my biggest worry would be, well, what if I put somebody up there who doesn't energize the whites, but is just sympathetic towards minority voting, that person would have gotten blown out this election. You cannot afford to lose any of the white vote. Yeah. That's frightening. I mean, and cause you're not going to have a white power party ever take over. And you're going to have a tough time finding somebody who never, never says anything like white power, but who doesn't throw an occasional bone to other races the way that Donald Trump does. So let's move on to uh, just one other number on, on race here, for instance. Uh, a, and the libertarians, like it's like 4% whites, 4% non-whites. It's a total non-issue uh, when it comes to Brenton's votes here in Indiana. Uh, race by gender, white men, 60% uh, Republican, white women, 49-49. Uh, and then every other black man, 88, black women, 92, Latino men, 63, Latino women, 73, uh, other 66%. You know, so once you get into whites, 45-64, 59% Republican, whites, 65 or older, 56%. So... Uh, it is kind of mirroring what you, you would kind of think that Republicans are older, they're whiter, they are uh, really the voters in this election, we should say, but by and large, the people that took the exit polling. Um, when you go to education, it is all very even, high school or less, some college, associate's degree, those are all 50-50, roughly. Um, bachelor's degree, 55% Democrat. And then advanced degree, 65%. So it stands to reason, Hody, that the more education that you have, the more you've been indoctrinated, A, by leftist professors, but also that's, that's been a big problem 
once you once you go down into um, whites with no degree, 61% voted for Republican, 53% white college graduates favored Democrats. And this is what you saw in the suburbs. The people who voted Democrat uh, were white suburban voters. I, I really think what the way, the kind of the takeaway is all those soccer moms and values voters and Bush Republicans that put Bush over in 2004, those people didn't go away. A lot of those people were gen younger boomers like our parents, Hody, or Gen Y or, or, or Gen X. I mean, those people haven't gone away. And this was them saying enough, enough from both of the extremes. We're not going to have this. If you're an extremist on the left or the right, we're not going to put up with your BS. And so a lot of white collar whites in suburbs voted for Democrats who were more moderate. And I think that is the biggest takeaway is that people who are kind of those those Bush Republicans defected from Donald Trump as a message saying, stop. And there was a pullout today that 74 percent, I think, of people want Donald Trump to have a challenger in the primary. And it was like a pretty significant amount of Republicans wanted to see it was like almost 50 percent of them wanted to see him have a primary challenger. Uh, and so I think that his rhetoric, I think I was totally wrong in that, uh, you know, I said before the election, I just don't know how much of Donald Trump's tone or his bombacity or his Twitter account or any of that really matters to people. And apparently to Gen X and boomers, especially the educated ones, the white ones, they cared a lot and they defected from the Republican Party. And for... For Trump, every place he showed up to speak at turned red overnight. Right. I mean, it's it's it was unreal. Uh, they talked about the place that Obama visited, which he was largely ineffective. In fact, I believe uh, they had a breakdown showing that those actually went red more than blue. I don't think this is a rebuke of Obama. I just think people who say he's not president anymore, I ignore him. You know, and but Trump Trump managed to drum up amazing amounts of support from his party. That so so to me here's here's the real fright for Republicans. You have lost the intellectual vote essentially. We know that bachelor's degree, advanced degree. I don't care about that. That's always gone Democrat because, like you said, lengthen the system. People will then do IQ tests that show Republican, Democrat. Eh, you know there really isn't. You know you can show one poll, and for each poll that you shows Republicans are smarter, you can find one that says Democrats are smarter, and vice versa. So I think it's all irrelevant there as far as intellectuals go. One of the problems that I have is the Republicans are becoming, in their identity politics, they are rebuking the intellectuals. And I think that you're going to see a further separation with people who are educated, who are intelligent, that just simply don't like the buffoonery. This is, this is something, this is the splashback from the SJW movement, right? The SJWs pushed, Republicans pushed back harder, said, we hate that. Right. So I get it, right? I hate it too. The SJW movement used to be great and is now in, in look language is going to change either positive or negatively it makes sense to have social justice people out there say let's since we know language is changing let's make it in a way, way that it changes more inclusively so i understand the social justice cause i understand what the social justice warriors want to do but you're becoming a mind trap where people can't even have intellectual discussions anymore. So the Republicans push back against that. Unfortunately, they've pushed back against it so hard that Republicans are now saying, well, let, you know, who cares about even being smart anymore? Look at where your smarts got you. I don't care. Like, yeah, so well, I think, I think there, there is in some of this and in, in this election, you kind of see people who, who like those people who always like, all right, if you've been a libertarian for any length of time, you know the people in your life that kind of go, hey, what do you think about this issue? Or what's up with Gary Johnson? Can you tell me anything about him? They're, they're the people who are not engaged in politics, but they still vote and they kind of want some information. So they don't, you know, so they'll ask you about it. Those are the people that, that like this is, those are, that is America, okay? Like the people who, who can, like, we're, we're into this. You're listening to, you're in hour two, of, of a podcast breaking down numbers like you're really into it and so i think we have our own echo chamber where we're reading 538 we're reading new national review and new republic and we're like 
oh, this is how this is going to go. And we forget that those, those people who are just kind of like independent minded and not all that engaged, like they have a completely different worldview and view of politics. And so we've rationalized Donald Trump's craziness and the SJW craziness and we've found intellectual roots for it. And here's, you know, SJW rhetoric is caused by cultural Marxism in the Frankfurt School and MAGA, MAGA, MAGA is just a rebellion from global, you know, globalism. And like we have all, we have all that information, but like our, the, the majority of people who vote don't have that. And I think they just kind of go a pox on both of your houses and they go, I, I, I fully recognize that the left is crazy and I don't want those people in charge, but Donald Trump is nuts too. And I don't want him in charge. And uh, we'll see how much Donald Trump factored into this, you know, and, and those people are best represented by the independents. And when you look at the independents and you go to buy party ID, for instance, 37% de Democrat sample, 33% Republican sample, 30% independent sample. So of the 18,000 people, 37% said they were Democrats, 33% said they were Republicans, and 30% said they were independents. So, but they all voted, right? Yep. And so when you look at the independent line, 54 to 42 voted for Democrats. So 54 over 42. So that is 12 point, a 12 point difference in your independence. When you go into party by gender, um, independent men, 51%, 56% independent women. Uh, when you go to ideology um, and you go to the moderate, liberal, conservative, and moderate, 62% of moderates voted for the Democrat and 36 voted for the Republican. And so this was really a referendum on Trump, as we'll see, and he is just getting destroyed by moderates and independents. And his theory of, I can go out there and gin up the base, and I'll win, because that's what got me the hit. I'll just play the hits, and I'll cruise to victory because I'm invincible. Um, I think that's going, if he does that again in 2020, he, there is absolutely no way he wins because he, he is clearly not winning over independence. You can't, he doesn't have enough base to turn out because his base is going to continue to die over the next two years. And so if he just continues to go immigration, 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 the media sucks, like he's going to, he's going to lose. It, it, it will, it, it will uh, amazingly be a, a referendum on the Democrat, because Trump is a known quantity. And so Trump won because Hillary Clinton. And so if they run uh, a complete nut job who runs to the left, let's say Ocasio-Cortez gets the nomination, they're going to lose. That's not going to happen. But I'm saying, like, if, the, if they go intersectional politics full bore with Kamala Harris or Beto O'Rourke, they're going to lose big. If they go more Sherrod Brown from Ohio, they're going to win. Uh, so you're, you're, I think Trump isn't going to learn the lesson here, which is you're losing with independence and you really need those independents. You need to suppress Democrat enthusiasm, not votes, but just be so effective at your job that Democrats aren't excited to come out and vote for their person. Yep. And this is how you win any election. You, you are so good that you depress the other side and their turnout you get enough independence and you turn out your base and Donald Trump is only relying on one of those. And I think he's going to lose big in 2020. And I thought he was a shoe in to win again, but I, after you look at these numbers, Hody, I don't think so. You know, I don't, I don't like to project. I will say that uh, a lot of elections are decided and they probably shouldn't be, they should be decided on policy, but usually something happens like Kavanaugh. And you just, you don't see it coming and things go crazy and you lose a little bit of control of it. You know, Trump absolutely won because of Hillary Clinton. Make no mistake about that. And you got to remember for anybody who think Trump is a shoe in in two years, if Hillary Clinton was pick two of three, murderer, liar, thief, if she was only two of those three things, she kills him. But she gets people killed in Benghazi. She covers it up. She 
steals, she lies. Look, the Democrats are not going to put up a thieving, lying murderer twice in a row. And so, <laughs> and so Trump has to gain. He has to gain. He has to get something then. He has to make something of these two years. It's not good enough for him to just drum up the same people that showed up because the Democrats, I mean, uh, and we link stuff about Hillary saying she's going to run anyway. I don't think she survives that primary, even if she does. But I just, I mean, the Democrats have to be aware that that's like their new Pelosi. I mean, it's just people don't like her enough. And so the Democrats are going to put someone who's two or less of those things, who's only a thief, murderer, or liar, and win against Trump if Trump doesn't do something different than what he's doing now. I will say about all of these statistics, obviously, if these statistics were true that we're looking at, the Democrats win every single race and Republicans win nothing, but the Republicans won something. And so there is still a great deal of shame in being a Republican and not telling people the truth in your polls. I mean, there's no way that 37% of Democrats, 33% of Republicans, and 30% were independent showed up. That's not the voter base that we have. These independents are afraid to say whether they're Democrats or Republicans, and it looks like mostly Republicans are the ones that are afraid to say. Yeah, uh, and exit polling is usually more uh, accurate because people are like, eh, I already voted, I'll tell you the truth. Right. Um, when, when you go, when you factor in the libertarians, again, Lucy Brinton was part of the Indiana poll, and you go by ideology, 6% of liberals voted for Brinton, 5% of moderates voted for Brinton, and 2% of conservatives. So, the, the wasted vote syndrome has suppressed the amount of people that leave the conservative ideology for the, for the libertarian, but it's still a very small amount. Um, the largest percentage that she had was independent women at 12%. Being the only woman in the race, that makes sense. 7% of independent men broke for the libertarian in that race. Um, so when you go to another look at independence, um, First time midterm election voter, yes, 62% of them voted for the Democrat. Uh, in the 2016 presidential vote, 70% of those that did not vote in 2016 voted for the Democrats, and only 28%. Uh, so then you get into the approval ratings. Um, across the nation, 94% strongly of Republicans strongly approve of Trump. 95% uh, of Democrats strongly disapprove. Um, let's see. Was your House vote today? And I skipped a ton of stuff. Like you notice parents are strong Democrats. Mm -hmm. with the type of, they get into what, how many kids do you have? What type of kids? All, all, all kinds of stuff. So lots here if you're a nerd. Uh, what Was your vote for U.S. House today to support Trump? 95% of Republicans said yes. 4% of Democrats said yes. 94% of Democrats said they were there to oppose Trump. 4% said they were there to support. Or 4% 4, 4 of Republicans said they were there to oppose. I apologize. 44% of Democrats said that Trump was not a factor, and 52% said of the Republicans said Trump was not a factor. So, um, you know, strong support numbers and opposition numbers within the parties, but then also a really strong, eh, uh, Trump's are not really a factor in my in my vote, um, which shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, how many times do you say I'm a Republican but I don't support Trump? I mean, I right. I'm in red state Utah over here, and if you're a Trump voter, you're going to get your butt kicked saying that in public. So you right. always say I'm a Republican, but I don't like Trump. Don't worry, like don't, right. don't like hey hey relax relax. Even though like we look at our allies, we look at our results, and we're like, wait a minute, ninety percent of us are liars. We went hard Trump. Like, you know, <laughs> but when you when you um, when you look at this on a granular level, 26 percent said they were there to support Trump. Thirty eight percent said they were there to oppose Trump and 33 percent said Trump was not a factor. So 38 percent of those 19000 people said they were there to oppose Trump uh, at, a, at a very strong 54 percent said they disapprove. Forty five percent say they approve opinion of the Democratic Party. Forty eight percent favorable, 47 percent unfavorable. So it's about even. And opinion of the Republican Party, though, is 44% favorable, 52% unfavorable. Republicans have a better opinion, uh, or, or Democrats at 92% favor their party, Republicans only 87%. So the dislike of Republicans is much, much higher, even amongst Republicans. Um, 
I mean, two and a half years ago, we got Trump who almost boycotts the Fox News debates. Yeah. Now they're best friends. But, you know, some Republicans aren't as forgiving. You know, we remember that Republican basically, you know, Trump bucked the RNC and a lot of what traditional GOPers had to say. And I think there's a lot of GOPers that have, I mean, obviously their votes aren't, don't seem to be showing up, but that will stick to their roots and say, no, I still don't like Trump. I'm still never Trump. Favorable opinion of Nancy Pelosi, 31%. (laughs) Um, Favorable opinion of both parties. 6% of people have a favorable opinion of both parties. Neither party is 10%. uh, Only the Republican Party, 37, and only Democrats, 41. Uh, So, and when you look what, which, party should control the U.S. House, 52% of Democrats uh, said Democrats, 44 said the Republicans. And that ironically is around kind of where the, <laughs> the totals turned out. Uh, and then also the governors went for the Democrats and they now govern 52% of Americans, uh, the Democratic Party does. Uh, should Congress impeach Trump? <laughs> no, no at 56%, which is a really strong number. Uh, 30, 39% said yes. Uh, 92% of Democrats say yes, impeach him. 7% of Republicans, <clears throat> um, no. 19% of Democrats don't impeach him. 78% of Republicans say no. So there's much more, uh, oh man, we got to impeach him. Um, 76% of us say we're becoming more divided. 54% of us say we're on the wrong track. Uh, time of decision in U.S. House election. 8% of people decide who they're going to vote for uh, in their elections for House. Eight, 8% said in the last few days. And 53% of them voted for Republicans. Uh, time of decision. Last week. So just a few days before, 8% of people. In the last month, 19%, 63% earlier than that. So... You're talking in the last month, Hody, 16 plus 19. How much is that? Are you good at math? Yeah, 35%. All right. So you're talking about 35% of the electorate in the last month doesn't know who they're going to vote for. You're telling me you can't win some votes, Libertarian Party? Come on. (laughs) You know, so. um, And Lucy got 7%. And so that is because of the debate. Uh, because the debate was was really good. Uh, let's see here. I wonder what the favorables for like Trump and the Democrats are on the libertarian side. Let's take a look at that. I don't think our exit polling is that strong. Um, let's see. Dem- you know, they may, while, they, yeah. while you're looking up those numbers, the whole impeach Donald Trump thing. Look, here's the thing. I'm 50-50 on this. I could be convinced to impeach Donald Trump. Yes, anything he does, you can say Obama did it too, right? Anything that you appoint is an impeachable offense. But then maybe we set the president for precedent for impeaching all of our presidents when they do this stupid stuff. And I'm good with that. I mean, maybe we just get really strict about impeachment all of a sudden. So I don't necessarily hear the impeachment of Donald Trump and think how ridiculous, even though most of the time the people who say it are ridiculous. You know, you're, you're Maxine Waters and your Nancy Pelosi's. They're, they're insane, right? Now, I hate to fall in their bed and ally with them. But if they actually set a precedent by saying like, hey, you used the executive overreach, or you, you know, you made, you made it so that someone didn't have to testify. Well, we would have impeached Obama literally eight different times for executive protection. Right. So I mean, hey, you know, Im- impeach them all as far as, as far as I'm concerned. You know, if we want to get extra strict about it, let's get extra strict about it. I, I, I understand that it's the more moderate position that he probably hasn't done anything impeachable, but if we change the change the rules a little bit and f- as far as what gets you impeached, oh yeah, I'm on I think it, I think it would be a tremendous mistake. I think the Republican Party really suffered a big hit in, uh, it, through the, the impeachment of Clinton, mm-hmm. and I think it really it rubbed off a lot of that goodwill that they got in 94. They squandered it on impeachment. They didn't get him removed. The, the Democrats wouldn't get Donald Trump removed. I think the message of this was no silliness. Yeah. And this election was no silliness, and the ultimate silliness would be the Democrats fruitlessly trying to impeach Donald Trump because they're never going to get two-thirds in the Senate and get him actually kicked out of office. It would be a pure base play. 
And I think if the Democrats come in here and they try and do silliness as, as the, you know, they've got 87 different targets already that they're going to investigate, they're going to blow their opportunity. And there's lots of Democratic operatives talking to people like Axios and Politico saying, we're going to blow this because we're going to put Nancy Pelosi in charge. They're going to persecute the, in the eyes of America, the persecute the Donald Trump administration over nonsense. And then we're going to lose the house again. And we, you know, when we could have a really banner year and take all three chambers in 2020, we're going to blow it again. Democrats always blow it. Like they are just famous for blowing great. They have the, the media, they have the educational system, they have the minority vote. They have so many things going for them as a movement and they continually do dumb stuff. You know, Republicans are the same way. But I think impeachment as a strategy would be such a foolish decision for them because I don't think there's anything. The only thing that would rise, here's the thing. I think if they can knock loose his tax returns and they can prove that he is, you know, taking money from Russian oligarchs very close to very, very close to Putin, that may get enough people. I mean, I don't think that'd be enough for me to to think that it was impeachable, but I, I think you're going to. We have the trauma of Donald Trump and debating Donald Trump's behavior. We have the trauma of the SJW behavior. We have the trauma of just being a divided nation and politics being so pervasive. And then you're going to be the people that lay the trauma of impeachment on the American people. Nah, you're not, we're not doing this, you know, and I don't think with this new more conservative caucus within the democratic, I think, the media goes that way because it's the sexy story. But I think the media is wildly out of touch even from where the Democratic Party is. And so I think that the more conservative leaning members of the Democratic Party are really going to put a kibosh on this and say, no, we're not going to do that because you're going to lose me re-election. I'm not going to be one-termer. Sure. Me as a libertarian, they impeach Trump and their party gets destroyed. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. But oh. I think uh, oh, dude, I, I'm not. I, show. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a tactical. I'm not, I wasn't saying that tactically. I obviously don't believe that's a smart for, decision for them to do it. I think it, that's a microcosm of, of the Ka- Kavanaugh nomination, right? Ka- right. The Ka- Ka- Kavanaugh, Democrats, you might not like to hear this. The way that the Kavanaugh nomination was perceived saved the Republicans in this election. Yeah. Uh, You hate to point to one thing and say, this is what did it because obviously there's a bunch of issues, but when we looked at uh, you look at the Trump Hillary election two years ago, there's a 12% swing at one point. Now you say, well, Trump won by way less than that. So even if all the polls are wrong a little bit, obviously the Benghazi thing made a huge difference. The week that we found out that she knew about the attack beforehand, made up made up you know 12 percent swing six percent people le- left one side go to the other side we had a seven percent swing for the kavanaugh nomination among local um local politics and that absolutely saved the republican party and bailed them out this time it was a seven percent swing towards the republicans now i understand we as libertarians you've had it on the show before we are not big on kavanaugh we're not big on his decisions we don't love what he says about the patriot act we don't like the way he handled uh, abortion issues. He, he absolutely oversteps his ba- bounds. He's not a great libertarian judge. But the method absolutely has to make sense. They spent the entire time not asking a single question about his record and asking about some night 30 years ago that we knew was going to be he said or she said from the beginning. Right. And that destroyed the Democrats this election. If you kept that 7% lead Democrats, you'd have the Senate, you'd have the House, you'd have the governors, and the Republicans would have no chance in two years. Yeah. And that's, and you could have even refuted his nomination by saying, eh, at least I kept it about policy. If I made it about policy and said, I, I don't like his policy on this, that, or the other, believe me, libertarians would have backed you up, you know, and said, yeah, he was bad on those things. But so when, no. you, when you look here at Indiana in, in the Donald LeBron race, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? No, do it. Okay. Uh, so was Donnelly's Kavanaugh vote important to you? 51% said yes. 42% said no. Six, 59% of Republicans said yes, it was important to me. How important was Donnelly's vote? So you break that down. The most important factor, 11%. An important factor, 40%. A minor factor, 19 
and 24, not a factor. So I think when you have 11% of 2,300 respondents saying this is an important or, or the most important factor, that's pretty significant. And then uh, was Donnelly's vote a, f a factor to you? Yes. Uh, so when they say, was it a factor in your vote? Yes, 70%. And 41% uh, of Democrats, 54 for Braun, 6% in Brenton. So, you know, 6% said, ah, I'm out. Um, and 24% said no. So, you know, it absolutely, which, which quality mattered? Uh, so, so, yeah, it clearly factored in here in Indiana, for instance, and uh, motivated a lot of Republicans. Um, so let's move on to most important issues facing the country, 41% said healthcare, 23% said immigration, 22% said economy, and 10% said gun policy. So 75% of Democrats said it was the most important thing. That's what Democrats were turned out on. Immigration, 75% for Republicans. That's what they were turned out on. Uh, economy was more important to Republicans at 22. Gun policy, 70% of Democrats found that to be motivating. So when you look at this, um, Democrats are very motivated by health care and guns. Obviously, a lot of what's affecting them personally and then a lot of what they see in the news. And then immigration, what they see in the news, and economy, what's affecting them personally on the Republican side. This is the first time that economy has not been number one. Uh, health care at 41%. Uh, 60, I saw somewhere else that 60% of people, 60, 65, maybe even 69%, said that it needs, that the system is still broken. And so what you're going to have, and, and, and if you notice, Donald Trump never touches the, the uh, welfare. The, <laughs> he never touches Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. He's, ne he's oh, we'll never touch your pre-existing conditions. He'll grab you by other things, but not this. <laughs> um, but health care is going to be ra rapidly important. And I'm telling you right now, five years from now, if that, in 2020 even, you'll see the Republicans, they even started to kind of do it this cycle. They'll be running saying, we need, we need to basically, socialized medicine is a real possibility in the next 10 years, is what I'm trying to say. Because Republicans are going to see how much it matters to independents and even their base that we have healthcare get quote unquote fixed. And uh, they're not going to introduce free market solutions. They're going to go the easy route and centralize their power. Uh, so I think healthcare, you're going to see the Republican Party completely fold on healthcare within the next five years because it's so wildly, Obamacare is popular because of pre existing conditions. Yep. And, they didn't uh, propose anything themselves. Yeah. And right. they have no proposals. Yeah. That's the saddest part about the Republican Party, I think. You're supposed, you want to try to not be the party of no. You already face that anyway with the Republicans, just all the no votes on Obama. No anything. Let's not do anything. You had a chance now. You controlled everything to propose something to replace it. I mean, even something less socialized. You could have you pushed through on the American people, something that still kept the pre-existing conditions in, on insurance. Uh, Paul Copeland and I actually break that down. Pre-existing conditions, I don't care about it because it's not in the top 20 things that make – Think, make healthcare expensive in America. So fine, cave on it. That, if that's where your concession is, that's your concession. Give it, you know, and then do what you got to do as a Republican. To, but get something free market-esque together. They didn't even try. They yeah. just said, one of, anybody want to vote no on Obamacare? No? Okay, I guess that's it then, <laughs> you know? And then, I mean, they never talked about it after the first three months of Trump getting sworn in, you know? And, and so I just... Talk about disappointment if you're a Republican. Like you get, you seize control of everything and you don't do anything. Obama only did one thing, but man, did he push it through. Republicans, I mean, no spine. They didn't want to push anything through. They didn't, they weren't even in the mood to bribe anybody. Right. You know, they just said, eh, whatever. We'll figure it out. So let me kind of blaze through these here. Um, so let me see here. I lost my place. Uh, exit polls. Condition of uh, national economy. 68% um, said the economy's good, but um, has your financial situation changed versus two years ago? 49% said about the same. 36% said better today. Um, better being Republicans, but 69% that said about the same were Democrats. 
Uh, effective trades tr uh, policies on the local economy, most said it had no impact. Effect of the new tax laws on your personal finances had no impact. And it's drawn on partisan lines. The, the rest of it is like, if you're a Democrat, you think it hurt your personal finances. If you're a Republican, you think it helped. And all of those people are lying. Um, healthcare in the U.S. needs major changes. 24% say minor changes. No changes at 4%. So that's a pretty damning number. 50, uh, who would better protect pre-existing conditions? 50%, 57% Democrats. 46% uh, think that Donald Trump's immigration policies are too, tr too tough. Views on stricter gun control measures. 59% of people support stricter gun control. It's 37 oppose. That's a big, scary number. Um, view of the Russia investigation politically motivated at 54%. So most people think it's politically motivated. And 46, the majority of them think that Russia, the, the Mueller investigation, that he's handling it wrong. 46% um, 40, a majority think that uh, Trump is making the U.S. less safe. 66% uh, think that Roe v. Wade should be uh, kept as is. 47% oppose the Kavanaugh Supreme Court nomination. In the U.S. today, whites are favored. 41% think that. Minorities are favored. 19% think that. No group is favored. 33%. Um, people think electing women to office is more important, as well as electing more minorities. Um, sexual harassment in this country today is 46% think it is a very serious problem. 38% say somewhat serious. Uh, only 3% say it's not a serious problem. So the overwhelming majority of people think that sexual harassment is a serious issue. Uh, I think it is. I think I, I, that's so hard for me to deny. I think everybody knows somebody. If you ask enough, you know somebody within, if not immediate, extended family who's been a victim of it. Agreed. And that's, you know, for me, and she gave me the permission to say it, you know, I, I, I didn't know about it until until it, we did a show about it. And then she was like, yeah, my mom said, yeah, I was sexually harassed when I was a kid. And I just couldn't believe it. I, I think for me, it was stunning. My mom has always been a strong person. It didn't make her any less strong. My mom put a, on a tough chin and soldiered through life. And there's something to be said for not becoming a victim. And my mom is the biggest anti-victim I know. <laughs> she is not a victim. I shouldn't say anti-victim. She is the opposite of whatever a victim identity is. But right. it, it's happened to her. And I just think, uh, you look at the, um, another example, the, the Olympic athletes, the girls. These were literally the strongest women on earth. They're yeah. Olympic athletes that were, I mean, one guy, Larry Nassar sexually harassed. I mean, like, as far as convicted or testified, we're looking at like 200 counts, yeah. but probably more like in the thousands before he got caught. I think it's one of those, I lived in a world where I said, I would never do it and none of my immediate friends would ever do it and that's fine. And, that, and, that, and I could be right about that. I do come from a culture where if you sexually harass somebody and somebody finds out, other guys will come beat you up. You might die. But that's not the culture that everybody lives in. And all it takes is somebody that isn't from that culture getting his tentacles out there and making it happen. Yeah, I think... Um... I think, uh, yeah, partner rape, for instance, like I n never knew that that was a thing because it just w wouldn't, it didn't occur to me that you would force yourself on your wife. But like my friend who, who I was talking to, she's like, almost all of my female friends have had that happen. I'm like, what? And it, so I just think it is, it's a much more serious problem than people think. 50% yep. um, think that the government has not done enough to protect the election. Um, when it comes to Casting illegitimate votes or being prevented from voting. More people are concerned about being prevented from voting. Uh, now, this is an argument. How many, what's the percentage of the population that's LGBT, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender? 6% said they are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. And um, so, and 82% of them said that they are Democrats, 17 Republican. Uh, so that's always been the argument. Conservatives always like, there's only, there are only 2% of the population and the LGBT, oh, we're 10. And of course it lies in the middle. Uh, so 
Was recent extremist violence important to your vote? 74% said yes. 18% said no. The most important factor in your vote was the recent extremist violence was 23% and 51 said an important factor. And those are overwhelmingly Democrat voters. So for Republicans or, or for Democrats, the, the recent shooting was very important to their vote. Um, and so, yeah, 83% said yes. Extremist violence was a factor in my vote. No. So, so I think it's too bad about getting exit polling that it's not because it's more accurate you wish you could have it all year long but of course you can only have it once right and you'd be curious to see how many of this actually changed because in the case of kavanaugh that might not have been the most extreme poll like uh, exit poll number but it was something that you could see in the polls changed the most minds yeah whereas it's easy to say Oh yeah, these Republican violent people, did that affect my vote? Yes, it did. Well, you were but were you already gonna vote Democrat prior to that? Right. I don't know, because that's not on the national polls. It made it to this exit poll, which I you know is interesting and at least a lot of people care about it. But it'd be interesting to see if that just established the Democrats and saying, I'm already voting Democrat, but now I'm definitely doing it because this guy, th these, you know, three right wing nuts in the week, you know, go and kill people. Or if this actually changed people's votes. I didn't see that overtaking, like being as something as strong as, say, the Kavanaugh nomination. But it'd be, I guess it would be interesting to see if it did make any changes. Yeah. Well, I think it, uh, it just shows you how important and motivating healthcare and guns are to Democrats. And I think libertarians sometimes miss some of that stuff because everyone's so obsessed with what Republicans are obsessed with because the, the, Democrat, the, the media gets obsessed with it. Like, oh, look at this idiot Republican. And so you turn on, you know, J the Jimmy Kimmel show and it's just another dumb Republican now, you know, and so we're all consumed with kind of immigration and here's the thing that Trump said. And you, so you kind of lose what's important to real Democrats, you know, because you're so focused on what, you know, and then everybody on the other side's like, oh, look at this, what Jimmy Kimmel said, what an asshole, you know? So it, it does, it's like, it, it, it is a, uh, it's interesting to see. And I think gun, I think libertarians and people that believe in gun rights, like you, you have to come up with some better arguments. I think with healthcare too, I think those are two very important issues that libertarians don't have good answers on, have never had good answers on and uh, need, need to stop failing in it. Because when you look at Brenton's exit polling, the majority of the people who like, do you have an, a, favor, a favorable opinion of the Democrats? It was like 9%. Yeah. Un, you have a favorable opinion of Republicans, 1%. So like the majority of people draw, being drawn, if it is, like it, it's like minimal, right? Right. But, the, but it is, liberals are more interested in, in the Libertarian Party than maybe we give them credit for. Uh, and so it, you, you're you're going to have to come up with, I think that's why the healthcare episodes that you and Paul have done have resonated with people because it's like, I need an answer. I need to, I need you to really like give me an answer on this. So. Well, and Paul um, and I aren't looking at the status quo either. Most right. of the time when people get presented with a one or the other, they just say, how do you vote on this proposition? How do you vote on prop two? How do you vote on referendum D? And I think libertarians need to embrace the, we would vote for something completely different. I think you, you just say, oh, well, you're a Republican because you vote with the Republicans X percent of the time. Or you're a Democrat because you vote with the Democrats X percent of the time. And I think we really need to focus, especially in healthcare, on overhauling the entire system. Something that Republicans and Democrats are not talking about and something that the American people are very interested in right now. You know, we're already striking while it's hot on the dr drug debate. I think healthcare is the next one to go. And I think libertarians have all of the answers on healthcare. I mean, Paul and I talk about cutting it fractions uh, le way less than 10 percent of what you're paying right now by doing things that don't affect anybody <laughs> getting right. cleaning up you know admin fees and and stupid regulations and giving people the right to try and freeing up the market on on uh, prescription drugs you know things that are ga have gained momentum among the american people and looking at at it that way I think that's the reason Paul and I have been so successful in talking about healthcare reform is because it's something that non-libertarians are interested in as well. And they want more than just who, which, who do we rob? 
do we make sure these people with these pre-existing conditions die or do we make sure that we steal money from these rich people right that's the dichotomy we have right now and both of them are really non-factors in the healthcare system all right let's let's wrap up with one final thing the pollster showdown so you actually were keeping track of the pollsters and their predictions Obviously, the most accurate was me, but uh, after that, who who are the most accurate pollsters for the 2018 elections, and so, how did you come to this determination? One quick correction. It was actually Harris X was the only one to predict Donnelly in Indiana, so okay. I got to give them, hats off to them. Okay, so something that I noticed, uh, so we only had two pollsters that were willing to make projections about every race. House, Governor, Senate. And that was Sabata's Crystal Ball and 538 of CBS News. Um, so my hat's off to them for even just trying. Quick correction, uh, it's ABC News. ABC, I'm sorry. <laughs> ABC okay. is 538. Um, so something while we're looking at the polls here. Uh, Sabato. Sabato. Best. Sabato? Sabato, yep. Sabato. Sabato, mm -hmm. see. See, I'm with you on the last names, man. I, they yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, he actually did the best. He got 40 correct and 15 wrong. Now, these measurements were only among close races. So everybody got a bunch right in the races that you already knew about. So this was only among the battleground positions, the, the pick em positions. Um, 538 was not, cl not far behind. They were 38 and 17, so two less right than him. Now, those are the two that project, predicted every race. On top of that, they also were the only two that didn't do actual polling. They, now, in the case of ABC, they did have polls, but then they also in 538 said, yeah, here's what the poll says, but here's what we're picking. And in many cases bucked what their poll said. Um, if you just said, here's how I think it's gonna go, those two races, they went 78 and 32, 78 right and 32 wrong. So a little bit over, what, 66%? Looks like about two-thirds, right? Um, oh, that adds up to 100, doesn't it? Oh, no, 110. Anyway, uh, so like over two-thirds, right? Among the people who actually did polls, who said, who are you going to vote for? They released their questions. They got very in-depth. They called people. They asked online. They visited people's houses. They went 53 and 54. They actually got one more wrong than right. Now, uh, my hat goes so off. So you're saying that uh, Larry Sabato at the Center for it's at the University of Virginia, and five and five thirty eight, they have uh, models that they run, and they got seventy eight to thirty two. But then the people who put polls in the field and make the phone calls, those people did fifty three fifty four. They were less. They were less than fifty percent accurate. Whereas the people who do modeling based on all these polls were nearly 75 percent right the not only modeling based on the polls but also were willing to make adjustments something that was notable among 538 is they have abc polls and in many cases 538 predicted against the polls we talked earlier in the show about how if the chips fell where they would this would have been a democratic blowout 538 knew that's not how the chips are going to fall it rarely is they knew that Republicans were ashamed to admit that they're Republicans, and they took a guess at about the percentage. There probably was a model of the percentage uh, of how many were closeted, and they were they were rewarded for it. Um, I did want to say, as far as actual phone call polling goes, Emerson College went 15 and 5. Yeah. Which, if it weren't for them, we'd be looking at like less than 40% correctitude. Yeah. among those who actually called and asked who are you voting for new york times polling was 17 to 15 cnn yep. called three three right three wrong yep. uh trafalgar which had some really weird polling that we were like these guys are on crack they were six yeah. and four <laughs> yeah um, and and honestly even being above 50 percent hat goes off to him a little bit because you look at survey usa at zero and five fox only did one poll zero and one yeah. you know I, I mean just nbc at three and six harris x at three and four gravis at five and seven just terrible numbers i mean yeah. when people are coming to you to say <laughs> what's things looking like and, and it's not really their fault so much as they all they can do is call and ask the question 
And what we've come to realize, and I think this showed up in last election, it's still true in this election, there's just a certain amount of people that lie, that just say, I, I'm not going to participate in this, or, or I'm not, I'm ashamed to say. And if you don't count that as part of your model, then you're better off finding somebody like Sabato or 538 that will include it as part of their model. Yeah. Um, notably, there are some guys who threw in the towel. You'll notice uh, Rasmussen and Gallup didn't try this election. Hmm. They tried on other things. Those have actually largely gone into corporate uh, America in, in interviewing um, you know, previous clients and seeing how, how those things are going, but they've almost, they've almost stopped. The only major one that exists from uh, two years ago was Quinnipiac, and they, uh, they only predicted four. They went one in three, and they only predicted, predicted four. So you want to talk about how backbreaking the election of two years ago was to the major pollsters. They got run out of business. They yeah. don't do they don't do it anymore nationally. And, and so what a lot of times uh, these media outlets will fund the polling and they'll go to a college and then the college will use college students to make the phone calls and then that's how polling is usually done. So it's a bunch of college students calling people on landlines. So the, the, that's why I say the uh, like so your best bet is Sab Larry Sabato and the 538 gang. Uh, just to get somewhat of a picture, you know, look at the real clear politics. But yeah, here in Indiana, there were, none of the polls were right about the Indiana Senate race. And so you just had to kind of go by feel and it felt like Braun was going to win, but it was going to be a little close because Donnelly is well liked here. But yeah, I mean, there's no reliable poll here in Indiana, for instance. And so, um, all right, let's let's wrap it up. But that's great information that tells you like when you see those polls from NBC or New York Times, like, a eh, grain of salt with that stuff. Yeah. So. Unless it's like a spread of like 10%, you could be looking at something that's, that's maybe, maybe closer than they say. Right. All right. Well, I feel that we have told people everything that they could possibly know about this midterm. We have put it to bed. We have, uh, we waited a week, really researched our stuff, trying to find, uh, f find um, uh, our buddy Abdul's poll was good. Uh, Paul says, uh, let me unmute Paul. Uh, eh, I can't unmute him. I made you the host. That's why. Oh, did you, did you, oh, it was Paul I, I on this call? He heard me compliment him the whole time, didn't he? Yeah. Paul, uh, our buddy Abdul over at Andy Politics did a poll and he was accurate. Yeah, he was, uh, more accurate than all of the national level bolsters coming in and looking at the state. Sweet. All right. Well, credit to our buddy Abdul then. All right, Hody, mute him. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Love you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks right, for making well, me famous, Paul. Bye. <laughs> yeah, so we have, we have given people uh, a full look. You, there's literally nothing else that you could possibly know about this stupid midterm and what to come uh, in, in, the day, in the years ahead. So, uh, Hody, give us your final thoughts for this episode. Well, I'm going to talk about We're Libertarians in general. Chris uh, asks nicely, and I know he hates to ask, uh, about subscribing. If you've made it this far in the episode, Medal of Honor, and you probably really love this show a lot. And he works really hard. Chris is actually putting together a network, and that could be something unique compared to most of the shows that you watch. Sometimes there's only one or two people involved. We've got voices. We have, a, we have Republican and Democrat registered voices here on the We Are Libertarians network. Okay, so this is, this is, we're branching out. We're having discussions, we're having debates, we're thinking about doing shows about debates, we're thinking about doing more, but the only way we're gonna do more is with your Patreon support. The other thing that you should know is we have extended a lot of benefits to that $10 a month and up program. We're talking one-on-one -on -one access to the people who make the shows, we're talking to being able to communicate with them during the show if there's, a, there's something that you wish to suggest. Uh, so please donate because that's how things expand. And I don't look any good if you just say, Hody's really great a lot of times in an email. But if you feel like giving that $10 a month, if that's something that you have, if you can give up that coffee run twice a week for little old Hody, I really would appreciate it. I've had so much fun here on the Weird Libertarians Network and it's something that I really want to have continue, but we can't do it without your support. So uh, let me do the selling this time. Chris, if they just need to hear a different voice. And, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now that frees you up to talk about something completely unrelated. 
Yeah, I want to thank. Uh, I, I want to. I'm three hours into the show and a very and a very very like I haven't felt great today, so I, I apologize. Uh, I, I'm just speechless that somebody was willing to give the speech. And and as Reinhold says in the group chat, it's value for value. It's just like the No Agenda guys. Those guys preach it all the time. I should beat you over the head just as hard as they do, saying, "Listen, you get something for the show. You gotta you gotta pay something." You know, give us value. We give you value. And uh, we put everything that you donate on Patreon back into this thing. And, uh, you know, it takes equipment. I'd love to, um, I've actually got a proposal out. And if that comes through, I'm going to buy equipment for everybody. So the Daily Show sound top notch too. And not that they don't sound great, but they could always sound better. Uh, and so we're, we're out there busting our butts trying to bring all this research and information to you and give you a complete picture of the world. And so you're willing to pitch in then please do thank you to jason doolittle i almost said uh what the wall management calls him jason doofoodle uh just my favorite flub from that bit uh craig DaCosta, the libertarian coalition and christy avery for being our 100 a month subscribers and uh yeah my takeaway from this is that trump could be in real trouble for re-election uh and i don't think that uh i think that both sides could be in real peril uh, I think the Democrats are, are going to blow it because they're not going to learn the lesson of moderation. The Democrats or the Republicans are not going to blow it because they're not going to learn the lessons of moderation. And libertarians can't stop talking about being more radical and more pure, and they're going to blow it. And they're not going to grow. And I think that they need to. And uh, so we have to figure out a language that um, appeals to moderate Americans that doesn't scare them off but is still pure. And I think Larry Sharp was a great model for that. Jeremiah Morrill in Henry County was a great uh, lesson for people. It's, go watch the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast. And so I think that's the takeaway is <laughs> sort of a, what Alinsky said a long time ago. you got to drop the radical pose and adopt the moderate position And uh, if you really want to have revolution. So put on the suit. And uh, get out there and, and um, it's, it's not manipulating. It's not lying. That's not what I'm saying. I know some of you are going, are you saying lie to them? No, I'm not saying lie to the public at all. I'm saying lead with the issues that they care about. People, we see it in our numbers. People want to hear the libertarian solution to healthcare. So research a really good explanation on how healthcare can be fixed. People want to hear what our, uh, why we believe in uh, no gun control. And they want to hear a rational, reasonable argument. And we, would, we don't want to put in the work because we want to just fight over memes all day. So uh, we've got we to gotta stop that. So anyways, thanks for joining us here on the show. I appreciate uh, all the work that you put in, Hody, and thank you so much. Thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers for making this possible. Thank you to all of our listeners for sharing this program. If you can't join us on Patreon, then please share, share, share. That really does help as well. So thank you so much. All right, Hody, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Kisses. <laughs> All right, and we will see you tomorrow. All right, Hody. Sweet. Uh, oh, you have to stop the recording. Oh, they're going to hear this too. Love you guys. <laughs>